Hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, October, October, the March 15th, uh, Ides of March. Uh, be careful today, especially if you're a Roman senator. And uh, so can we have the call to order, please? Okay, roll call. Trustee Broderick. Present. Trustee Bozinski. Here. Trustee Garcia Guillen. Yes. Trustee Lee. Trustee Mahalik. Here. Trustee Morales. Here. Trustee Stamborski. Here. Trustee O'Connell. Here. And as I said, welcome here. We're still waiting for someone to show up. But uh, uh, as uh, we're doing this, uh, Josh, can you do the pledge sure. for us? <coughs> Thanks for that. I, you know, sometimes you gotta you gotta really get it in your face. You know, the flag on me for this. So, uh, one point zero four. Public comments. We do have someone who's requesting to speak. We have Brandy Angler, who's from Joliet, 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 Joliet Junior College, who is addressing um, item number 2.1.5. And I just want to say as a reminder, Joliet Junior College welcomes public comments during its monthly board meetings. Per policy 01.55.01, .01, the purpose of this opportunity is to direct comments to the board on agenda items, keeping in mind that comments should be in good taste and please demonstrate consideration for others. Please refrain from any inappropriate, irrelevant, or disruptive comments, and each speaker is allowed up to five minutes to speak. Thank you for following this procedure. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Brandy Anglin. Again, <laughs> I think you'll find I'm item 2.1.5 on your agenda for non-reappointment. I addressed the board last month, I'm here once again, because I'm on the agenda once again. Um, last January, I submitted three courses for approval to be taught online here at JJC with approval from my department chair, John Larada. This approval process has several steps and is conducted through iCampus. My courses were first evaluated by three peer faculty reviewers. They were all complimentary, they had minor comments, and they were approved within a few days. The next step, those, those courses went to my dean, um, Dean Wilcox. She approved all three courses once again with only a single minor comment, once again in a matter of days. Finally, the courses were sent to my department chair. After looking at one of the three courses for a total of 11 minutes, he announced that he would not be approving them. He did not give any specific detailed reason other than he did not seem to like the textbook materials I had used and they weren't set up the way he set up his courses. When I pointed out that he hadn't spent much time reviewing the courses, he became defensive. He insisted he was a subject matter expert, even though he has no qualifications to teach two of the three courses I proposed. After a month, with no further comments or feedback from my chair, I contacted Dean Wilcox. In a meeting between myself, the dean, and the department chair on March 10th, Dean Wilcox told my department chair to make a decision on my course proposals. He ignored those directions, and another month went by. On March 10th, I had a meeting with Dr. Gray, myself, Dean Wilcox, and my department chair. Dr. Gray asked if my department chair had approved my courses. He said that he had. This was not true. He had not approved any of them by that course. This was demonstrably not true. All of this is archived in iCampus. The final course approval by my chair was sent to iCampus in July, six months after I had initially submitted them. On July 20th, I contacted Judy Connolly in HR. I felt my department chair had deliberately withheld feedback and a decision on my course proposals. Other faculty in my department who had submitted courses at the same time as I did got feedback and a decision with a few days. Mine took six months. She acknowledged my message, but there was never any follow-up, at least not with me. 
In another hand, as part of the outline tenure process in the contract, several documents need to be placed in my tenure binder. The department chair is supposed to submit a memo regarding reappointment by January 15th of each year. Last year, 2022, my chair was one week late in submitting his memo. My department chair's year-end evaluation using the proper form last spring was submitted one month after the deadline. My department chair's menu regarding reappointment for this year was once again not placed in my tenure binder by the deadline. My dean's memo of reappointment was not placed in my tenure binder by the deadline of January 31st. When I repeatedly asked Dean Wilcox to view those memos, she refused to show them to me. What I didn't know at the time was that the tenure committee was also telling Dean Wilcox to place those memos in my binder. She once again refused to do that. I feel that there is a culture of indifference when things are pointed out to be wrong by faculty members. Um, I had gone up the chain of command as I saw it to get rectification or any type of decision on my courses. I have positive student evaluations. I have positive evaluations from my faculty mentors. My department chair and my dean has given me positive recommendations. I'm very good at my job. You will not find anybody more qualified for my position than I am. I would like to continue doing my job here at JJC. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that. Are there any Karen, other Karen, we have someone else, right? Um, we have some communications. Communications. So the first communication we have is from Carol Foote. Um, she is the secretary in the Fine Arts Department. She sent a note in to say, I wanted to take a moment and thank everyone for reading out, for reaching out to me following the passing of my mom. It was not the outcome we expected and it has been a very difficult time for us. Whether you emailed, sent a card, called, sent food, or came in to the service, your support means so much to us. Words cannot express how grateful I am to all of you. I'm reminded how amazing the JJC community can be in tough times. My heartfelt thanks to everyone. And then we also have Carmen Carter, the Vice President of African American Business Association. You wanna come up to the podium? Good evening. My name is Carmen Carter, and I am the Vice President of the African American Business Association. And today we wanted to come out to express our gratitude to um, Dr. Farmer and the JJC Entrepreneur and Business Center for um, uh, African American Business Association. So small businesses employ 61.7 million workers in America. Half of the, of the United States employees work for a small business, according to Forbes. With having hundreds of different business industries and different needs and organizations, ABBA exists to transform Will County into the most equitable, inclusive, and vibrant local economy. We realize that we need partners to do that. So we teamed up with the, Latin Amer the, La the Latino Economic Development Association. Uh, we also teamed up with uh, the Joliet Junior College Entrepreneur and Business Center uh, for technical assistance and the incubator space. ABBA is known for focusing on building up our businesses and the community. We have a CEO bi-monthly roundtable, as well as our Marching Into Mondays, which is where we did our kickoff with the Latino Economic Business uh, um, Development Association at the uh, center down at downtown Joliet a few weeks ago. It was a huge success. And um, monthly, we usually have about 75 to 100 business owners at our Marching Into Monday meetings. They have become a very huge success and a big part of our forward mobility. And uh, again, I want to thank Dr. Farmer because when we had reached out to her knowing that we needed to um, collaborate on some things, she immediately jumped into action and uh, connected us with the JJC uh, Entrepreneur and Business Center. Uh, and um, the last thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be sitting down with a group of presidents to identify ways that we can coexist and continue to offer services to our local businesses and community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, we do have one more communication. Thank you for that. Uh, we have Angel Contreras, the supervisor of the Joliet Government Township, and Cesar Escutilla, who is the Joliet Township Government Trustee. Good pre-evening, right? Or is this a twilight, late afternoon, pre-evening? Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, having us. Uh, we bear, uh, we bring, uh, bring gifts. Um, we actually uh, wanted to uh, address the 12 by 12 by 12 program that the, the board and Dr. Mahu passed. Um, when that came to be, we we're excited, right? Uh, Trustee Morales wears many hats. One of the other hats is she's our uh, Joliet uh, Township Clerk. So when this opportunity came, um, we always talked about, you know, enrollment into our local community college. So then what can we as our entity uh, do to help facilitate uh, that this program is successful, but beyond? So we came up with the initiative. Um, so Joliet Township, uh, anyone, any student that lives within the Joliet Township government boundaries that completes the 12 by 12 program from any school will receive uh, up to four credit hours paid to then post attend JJC. Um, so we're very excited for this because we do want like our communities, all our entities to come to this institution that is theirs, right? I know everyone here through all levels, you know, I've gone through here, Escutia has gone here, trust me, everyone that's gone through the school, we want it, we want people to take advantage. It did help a lot. So this is kind of our way to directly help get the message out that this is there, this institution is part of the commons, you know, because it comes from the local tax base, we support this as a community. So through our community dollars, we want to continue that to the next step. So, you know, we get students involved, get them into school, and then put them in the right trajectory uh, through the community college, whether and taking advantage of it, that rather than going to another institution. So this is just our way to adding to that, and we just wanted to present. You know, the first our first round will be for twenty five thousand uh, dollars, and then if as it grows, we'll be able to support it more. And we hope this message goes beyond just our Joliet Township uh, government borders, and you know, the rest of the JGC district, other entities that can that can do this, take advantage of this, because the entire JGC district community should be taking advantage of this program to put our our our, our youth on the right trajectory to take advantage of what's already theirs. So we just wanted to, you know, get out here and express that and and hand over the big check. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's, let's do that. Hold on. Yep. He's not, not you, he should, because you can't be anything because you're not. I'm not a loaded person. No, but you're a loaded person. You're a loaded person. Yeah, I'm not a loaded person. Okay, put you. Thank uh, all my trustees. Some of them couldn't make it, so I want to I want to thank our trustee Susanna Ibarra, trustee Ray Slattery, uh, trustee Carl Farrell, trustee Scutia, obviously uh, Clerk Morales for bringing this to attention, and then everyone collaborating, brainstorming. So how can we integrate one of our community partners doing and us integrating our you know our statutory ability to continue to just collaborate with everyone? So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Have much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman O'Connell, if I may, I just want to extend a huge gratitude uh, to the township for this. And I love that you put some pressure on some other entities as well to do the same because you're stepping up to support the students in your area. And uh, we'll, we'll honor your commitment and we're going to serve them well. We All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Still under communications. Do we have Christopher Parker? Uh, no, Christopher Parker was um, replaced. Repla okay. All right. Okay. Um, All right. Then uh, in that case, we're down to the closed session. 1.05 on 2C1 and 2C11. And uh, so we'll try to make it move along. So the closed session 
will be held to discuss one or more items pursuant to the Open Meetings Act 5 ILCS 120-2. The Joe Junior College Board of Trustees may take action upon one or more items discussed in closed session upon its return to the open session. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Trustee Broderick? Aye. Trustee Stamborski? Yes. Trustee Pazinski? Yes. Trustee Garcia? Yes. Guillen. Trustee Lee? She's not yes. here. Oh, she is here. Trustee Mahalik? Yes. Trustee Morales? Yes. Trustee O'Connell? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. Okay. There's a little, little slap on it. Uh, 107, we, returned to, we have returned to public session. I motion to return the regular session. Second. Okay. Uh, Trustee Mahalik? Yes. Trustee Morales? Yes. Trustee Broderick? Aye. Trustee Bazinski? Yes. Trustee Garcia Guillen? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Stamborski? Yes. Trustee O'Connell? Yes. Motion carried. All right, Mr. President, 1.1, moment of silence. Chairman O'Connell, trustees of the board and members of the JJC community, um, I'm asking the college community to join us in a moment of silence for the following individuals tonight. James Burnett, father of Denise Burnett in records and administration, records and registration, excuse me. Barbara Koziol, mother of Carol Foote in fine arts. Francis Sidin, father of Lynn Douglas McGee in Project Achieve. Carl Roach, adjunct instructor in English, philosophy and world languages. Sally Grace, retiree in business education. Robert Brophy, an alum of JJC, and Lewis, Lois, excuse me, Claude Felter, mother of Rob Claude Felter, in our Technical Tutoring and Learning Center. I'd like to add my cousin Paul, Paul Sai, that just passed away. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. 1.2, selected reports. And 1.2.1, Board of Trustees approval of Community College Month Proclamation. Roberto Melendez. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. It is my pleasure to introduce Juliana Aguilar Magaña, she will be doing the Community College Month pro Proclamation. Juliana is a first-gen JJC student. She will be graduating this May with her, her Associate of Arts. She will be transferring to Governor State University this fall to pursue her dream to becoming an at-risk youth advisor at Joliet Township High School. She is also a student with the Workforce Development of Will County's Connect to Your Future program. Through that program, she has gained real-world experience and has served in an internship with the jo Joliet Region Chamber of Commerce and Industry. She is currently interning with our TRIO's ETS program at City Center Campus. Juliana is an advocate for racial equity and wants to address educational disparities among children and the educational and criminal justice system. She works in the community creating awareness about the school to prison pipeline. So, Juliana. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. The Proclamation Community College Month. Whereas more than 1,200 community, technical, and junior colleges, public and private, in the United States have contributed enormously to the richness and availability of American higher education. And whereas the public and private community, junior and technical colleges provide a board array of educational services, which include transfer education, two-year associate's degrees, program certificate programs for employment, basic skills education, continuing and community education. 
And whereas the community colleges work in partnership with businesses, industry, and government to provide job training assistance and economic development, and whereas community colleges provide necessary resources for community service, including career development, job search assistance, counseling, and developmental education. And whereas through these services, community colleges meet diverse and changing local needs and fulfill a vital function within the state's higher education system. And whereas community college provide an opportunity to obtain post-secondary education at a reasonable cost within community, commuting distance of their students' homes. And whereas Joliet Junior College is one of the 39 community college districts in Illinois providing occupational, pre-bachelorette, in continuing education courses and in services to, to more than 1 million Illinois citizens each year. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Joliet Junior College Board of Trustees hereby designates the month of April as Community College Month in Illinois, Community College District number 2525, and encourages all citizens to recognize and value and recognize the value and opportunities available to them at Joliet Junior College and at community, technical, and junior colleges throughout the United States. Adopted this 15th day of March, 2023. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Very nice reading. Those are difficult too, so. Yeah, sometimes. 1.2.2, Board of Trustees approval of Arab American Heritage Month resolution. Mr. Valdez. I'd like to introduce uh, Narjes Suez. Narjes teaches interior design in the art department at Juliet Junior College. In addition, she is a self-employed interior designer. Narjes holds an MBA in digital marketing from St. Xavier University, a BA in interior design from the International Academy of Design and Technology, and a BS in Accounting from the University of Jordan. Narjes. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Resolution for Arab American Heritage Month. Whereas Juliet Junior College would like to officially recognize April as Arab American Heritage Month, to acknowledge and celebrate the history of those who have made and continue to make valuable contributions in our society and ensuring progress and lasting equality for Arab American individuals. And whereas it is appropriate and right to celebrate a diversity of cultures and heritages and such celebration serves as a reminder that despite our differing backgrounds, everyone in Illinois is bound by a common hope for a better and more inclusive future for our children. And whereas the Arab American community has a long and integral history in the United States. And whereas for over a century, Arab Americans have, ma have been making valuable contributions to virtually every aspect of American society, including medicine, law, business, technology, government, and culture. And whereas tens of thousands of Arab Americans have served during World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq after September 11, 2011. 2001, I'm sorry. And whereas the history of Arab Americans in American life often remains neglected and has been riddled with misunderstanding and bigotry. And whereas men and women of Arab descent have shared their rich culture, strong work ethic, and dedication to education while embracing the American spirit of opportunity and helping us build a better nation and state for all. And whereas 
it is estimated that there are approximately 450,000 people of Arab American descent in Illinois, with more than 100,000 Arab American voters registered. And whereas we recognize and celebrate the contributions to cultural diversity, economic growth, and the overall development of our state and nation made by the Arab American community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of Illinois Community College, District Number 525, Juliet Junior College, Counties of Well, Grundy, Kendall, LaSalle, Kankakee, Livingston and Cook, State of Illinois, does hereby recognize and honor April as Arab American Heritage Month, adopted this 15th day of March, 2023. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A little bit to heart. So All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. 1.2.3, Board of Trustees approval of Earth Month proclamation. <coughs> Gosh. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. So it is my privilege to introduce to you JJC student Andrew Flischleber. Uh, Andrew is a student sustainability intern and leader of the Sustainability Union. He is going into his second year of college and plans to graduate with an associate's in science and then transfer to a four-year college to obtain a bachelor's in ecology and conservation. Andrew hopes to pursue a career in restoration ecology where he repaired degraded environments back to their original biodiversity. Would my children's bedroom count? Really? <laughs> no. Andrew, come on up. Hello. Hello. Hi, Andrew. So this is the proclamation for Earth Month, whereas Earth Month is celebrated at Julia Junior College throughout the entire month of April with a focus on Earth Day, Saturday, April 22nd, 2023. And whereas beginning in 1970, Earth Day paves an avenue for growth and, and a connection to a global conscious which fosters s sustainability. Environmental, economic, and social equity issues are becoming integrated into numerous different career paths, government, and lifestyle choices. Whereas Friday, April 28th, 2023 is National Arbor Day, which is an annual observance that celebrates the role of trees in our lives and promotes tree planting and care. As a formal holiday, it was first observed in 1972 in Nebraska, but tree planting festivals are as old as civilization. Whereas Juliet Junior Co College recognizes the importance of sustainability through its board policy 9.12 sustainability adopted march 2012 whereas the juliet junior college sustainability union is leading the sustainability ambitions of of jjc campuses and are committed to their mission to educate students faculty staff and administration on the importance of sustainability through our individual and community contributions and actions during earth month the sustainability union wants the jjc community to acknowledge the personal responsibility we all share to think globally and act locally. As environmental stewards of planet Earth, this has never been more timely or important. Whereas JJC's sustainability initiatives will extend beyond the colleges, beyond the college and to Juliet's community and enable us to educate and inform the public as to what we can accomplish together. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Juliet Junior College Board of Trustees proclaims the month of April 2023 as Earth Month in Illinois Community College District number 525, adopted this 15th day of March 2023. So moved. So moved. Second. So moved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. 1.2.4, recognition of retiree Winifred Garza. Good evening. <clears throat> Whereas Winifred Garza has been a loyal and dedicated employee of Joliet Junior College from January 1999 through March 2023 for 24 years of service with the college, retiring as an office assistant too in the iCampus department 
And whereas throughout her years of service, Winifred Garza has demonstrated admirable support for the ideals of education, as well as for the institution of Joliet Junior College and the people whom the college serves. And whereas the service performed throughout her years at Joliet Junior College has always been of the highest standard of professionalism, quality and excellence. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of Illinois Community College District Number 525, Joliet Junior College, counties of Will, Grundy, Kendall, LaSalle, Kankakee, Livingston, and Cook, State of Illinois, does hereby recognize and commend Winifred Garza for her distinguished service, as well as for her diligence, perseverance, and loyalty in executing those duties as herein stated adopted this 15th day of March, 2023. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Okay. 1.2.5, Human Resources Report. Chairman, it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium our interim Chief Human Resources Officer, Judy Connolly. I wanted to provide the board with an overall uh, review, and you'll, you'll see um, quite a bit of detail here about the overall human resources function here at JJC. So, Judy, take it away. Thank you. Uh, Chairman O'Connell, trustees of the board, Dr. Namuo, members of the campus community, thank you so much. Um, it's exciting to be here and share information with you about our human resources, the functions that we do, our team, our structure, and the good work of the college. So let me go ahead and start. We are a team of 13, and in my opinion, we are an amazing uh, current team. I enjoy working with these individuals every day. They take great pride in their work their profession as human resources individuals. And we are all here again to advance the mission and vision and success of our employees and our students. Some of the team members are here today. Oh, they moved. <laughs> but let me quickly just uh, go through their names as you see on your screen and in your presentation. Um, of course, me, Judy Connolly, and I've been with the college 14 years now. Uh, Mark Morrissey is our manager of talent and labor relations. Um, Erin Farmer will be joining us. Um, she's out on leave right now, but when she's back, we have taken her from the DEI office to help us with our professional development, employee learning, and wellness. Uh, Tammy Albrecht is our senior administrative assistant. Jill Gears, senior HR generalist. Um, and then we have a couple of sub teams. This is the talent acquisition or talent management team. Uh, Hector Young, and they have a vacancy right now, so spread the word. We're hiring. On the total rewards team, we have Vanessa Duffin, Senior HR Generalist, Patty Sanchez, HR Generalist, and Vanessa Thornton, HR Generalist. And our HRIS team, which is Human Resources Information Systems, we have Krista um, as a Senior HR de Generalist and Cindy Vessel as an HR Generalist. So. A couple of things that I thought were of interest to share with you, um, the size of our organization. We are a large, um, you know, major employer in the Will County area. Right now, I checked in with payroll. We paid around 1,250 employees this last payroll for spring. Um, if you run the numbers, we have about 1,500 people open because there's fluidity with our adjunct instructors. They may or may not teach every semester. And I think payroll said they issued over 1,600 W-2s. Um, we have six collective bargaining agreements. I think you're familiar with those, but adjunct faculty, facilities, full-time faculty, food services, police, technical, um, and the technical office support staff council. And four of those are under negotiations right now. Uh, given the size and the number of unions, there are about 66% of our employees represented by a union with collective bargaining agreements. In FY22, uh, interesting fact, we had 5,547 applicants for the jobs that we had, and we had 305 hires. And one of them was you? <laughs> we know he was one. <laughs> and, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about talent management and talent acquisition, but um, we have been increasing both the the number of minority or non-Caucasian applicants as well as hires. And in FY22, uh, there were 305 hires, of which 
were non-Caucasian. Turnover, you might be curious. Um, we have a, had a couple of years that were higher. Of course, it's the great resignation and not uncommon, um, but we were a little less than industry, uh, which is nice to know. So 18 to 22 percent, I think 18 was the full-time staff um, turnover, and then 22 percent when you consider all positions. Uh, just today, we were talking about our upcoming employee service recognition. We recognize people for 5, 10, 15 years of service. And on that report, for 2022, we recognize the people who met their milestone. There are 89 individuals with 10 or more years of service and four that have over 30, they have 30 and 35 years of service. So I'll, I'll shout out to the, the, those four real quick. Tom Anderson from Facility Services, Shelly Maurer from IT, Ginger Hammond from Facility Services, and Gene Smith from Campus Police. But that's pretty amazing. So, you know, we talk about turnover, but there's an awful lot of longevity and pride here in our employees and their tenure. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about talent management, talent acquisition, and really this is a, a series of processes that are designed to attract and develop and motivate, engage and retain high performing talent here at JJC. So things like it starts with talent acquisition, bringing people in, leads to onboarding and engagement, their professional development, performance management, succession planning and workforce planning. Some of the things that we are focused on um, for talent management, first of all, we align our, our, our <coughs> it should say alignment, I'm sorry, and then the second bullet should be data-driven decisions, but we align well with um, other plans that are going on in the college. So our strategic plan, our DE&I plan, our technology plan, um, what we're doing in HR needs to closely um, support those efforts and its constant review and in, in, in modifications according to what the priorities are of the college. Um, we also work closely with marketing on branding and perception. And when there are campaigns such as JJC will be the first choice or you belong here, we are partnering on those campaigns for employees as well because that makes sense and is part of our, our value um, in attracting and retaining employees. We're spending a lot of time on the candidate onboarding and employee experiences. So evaluating what is the experience that the person has filling out their application, interviewing, being selected and starting. And then we don't stop there. What's the onboarding process? 30 days, 60 days, 90 days into a year. What, what are they experiencing? What are they what can we do to support the employees from HR? What can their supervisors do? That's more important than ever, um, just that overall start to finish experience. Um, and then we're also focusing a lot on employee learning and professional development, um, expanding that to be a more holistic approach for the college and meet um, the needs of individuals. I wanted to mention too that we supplement on the talent acquisition side our external recruitment sources. So we do, you know, a, a lot of standard sources um, inside higher ed, indeed. Um, we have our, our websites, um, diversityjobs.com, but then we also do internal campaigns to promote our positions. We do a weekly um, JJC is hiring and send that out and say, hey, here are the jobs that are open internally. And we have a pretty successful employee referral program. Um, for individuals to be able to earn a little bit of money by successfully referring employees to work here. Uh, okay. So on the total rewards, um, again, this is an intentional strategy. It's, it's a combination of compensation, leave, benefits, and wellness. We are trying to create a culture that inspires the retention of employees, wellness, purpose, and creativity and ultimately the employee value proposition, which is what the employees receive as benefits in exchange for their talent and their skills and their capabilities and experience. From a compensation perspective, this is always an ongoing um, review and analysis. Um, some people think it's just a one-time, you know, we'll look at it today and not look at it tomorrow, but our lens is on compensation 
uh, quite frequently with new hires or job position updates or more formally with studies. But ultimately, we want to be fair and competitive um, and attract and retain employees. So you hear me kind of keep saying the same messaging. But this is supported by board policy that um, the board adopted a few years ago, as well as administrative procedures. It says, hey, the college is serious about this. We will take time to review. We'll make adjustments as necessary. And then, of course, there's language on employee compensation found in all of the collective bargaining agreements. Total compensation, though, is more than just the dollars in your paycheck. It's benefits, it ho it's holiday pay, it's personal days. So again, it's the right mix and the right formula for JJC is what we strive to do. A couple things we have going on right now. Compensation-wise, you're aware that we have the Technical Office Support Staff Council um, salary study. Um, we're using a third party for that. We have our annual upgrade processes for a couple of our uh, classifications, including the admin uh, and non-union positions. Um, I know of major uh, concern and question um, from the board frequently is around our employee benefits, and, and rightfully so there, so there are some large bills and um, numbers that you see when you're approving the report of bills. So I want to spend just a couple minutes on this, and it, if there's anything you'd like to see more, we can always do a deeper dive. But um, we use Gallagher as our benefits broker consultant. Um, prior to that, we used CBC. We do go through a process to evaluate other vendors, but we've been with Gallagher for a few years. And they're um, instrumental. I mean, for an organization our size, the number of lives covered by health insurance, we need their expertise. Uh, they help with the RFP and selection processes for all the sub-vendors, so whether it's the employee assistance program or the vision program, they help us with all of that. There's day-to-day -day support for our HR team, sometimes directly to our employees. There's an awful lot of compliance related to benefits, so they help there. They also have access to all of the reports of um, our utilization, our claims, and they help with analysis. So they run that through their actuarial team um, and be able to do some price modeling for us, some forecasting uh, to help us make decisions for budgeting. And then all the processes, you know, new employees um, and annual open enrollment. They also produce and help us with our um, our, our piece for our full-time employees, which is the annual benefits summary. And I put one before each of you for review. If you'd like to, to have it, you can if you want to leave it behind. Um, but these are basically the health and a few other benefits. It does not include time off or fringe, but we've done a great job through the years trying to really give a tool to the employee that they can take home, share with their family to show um, what we offer. For those of you that are interested in the medical plan and just kind of what we offer for the PPO, that's on page seven. I know sometimes people will say, what's your deductible? What's your out of pocket? There's a one page at a glance to look at that. Um, I'll talk just a little bit about the PPO plan. So we offer on the health insurance plan two types. We offer a PPO plan, and that is self-insured plan, which means JJC pays the claims costs on a monthly basis. So the actual claim, the expense for me to go to quick care or for me to go have hip surgery, those claims are paid by the college through this plan. Those are variable costs. So you'll see when you're approving your report of bills, there might be a $600,000 monthly expense or a $900,000 monthly expense because it varies. Um, there are years that we've run um, favorably and there's years that we've gone over. It's, it's all a, you know a projection and based on utilization. This year we are seeing more claims, um, partially and higher claims, partially because of inflation with the cost of health care, but also because we believe there's some people who have deferred their care during COVID to take care of things now. So there just seems to be more, more claim volume um, after having a lower volume over the past couple of years. We um, can't do the administration ourselves. We can't approve those claims. So we use Blue Cross, Blue, Cross Blue Shield to administrate, administer the claims and we use their network. Um, and there are monthly fees. So there's a per employee per month monthly fee that we pay to Blue Cross to do that administration. 
If there's any, uh, we also want to protect ourselves if there's any large claims. So we have what we call a stop loss policy to cover claims that are in excess of 250,000. It's called a carve out plan. And um, to set aside money, you know, financially, we set an internal premium equivalent. So we're not sending a monthly premium to Blue Cross. We're just paying those administrative fees and then we actually pay the claims. But um, financial services will tell us what the budget number is as a premium equivalent and that money gets set aside into the fund and then the claims are paid from that. And then employees contribute towards their premium um, and the departments are actually charged the, that employer internal rate. The prescription program for the PPO is also self-insured, so we're paying the prescription costs um, for that plan as well. We, um, we are also self-insured for our workers' comp. And then we pay an annual fee to Gallagher to be our broker. Um, a few years ago, four or five years ago, we started offering an HMO plan. There was great desire by our employees to have more than one choice when they came in you know, to work here. And with the um, potential out-of-pocket expenses, deductible, co-pays, um, this, this plan, the PPO plan, was not necessarily appealing to everybody. So we researched the HMO, and um, today we have over 60 employees that have chosen that plan. Now, that is a fully insured plan. So we pay a premium for single coverage or family coverage. The college pays that to Blue Cross, um, and then they take care of all the claims. So there isn't that variability. Um, and then employees still have a contribution towards that premium. Part of, um, I mentioned, you know, the total rewards is, is compensation, benefits, leave plans. Um, when we're looking at things that have these dollar amounts, we are constantly reviewing. There's ongoing analyses and review. We look at things that we can be doing better. We look for cost savings. Um, and through the past, you know, 10, 12 years, uh, we've made quite a few adjustments to keep costs low. And then we've also made a few enhancements um, so a cost savings might have been changing the prescription program and encouraging mail order or having a differential if they didn't use a certain um, pharmacy. Big cost savings when we did that last year. We also added value-added benefits such as telehealth visits, um, pet insurance, pet RX insurance, I should say, um, and some other things like that that employees were asking for. We will be also conducting a benefits survey in April of 2023 to hear employees' opinions about our current offering and any desires that they have as well. Uh, we do a lot of programming, communication. We have a very active like open enrollment, education. We want everybody to understand the value of their benefits and be able to make choices on an annual basis if they want to make any changes. Um, we also keep up with policies and procedures. There's often things, you know, we just went through COVID, so we had to be um, mindful of policies and and um, different uh, benefits that were required through COVID. We have been exploring and working on uh, flex, flexible work arrangements here at JJC. We modified our, our tuition assistance um, last year and we are complying with some of the expanded bereavement requirements for family and, and children that have come in the state as well. And I'll just add, we also incorporate, uh, you know, appropriate technology. So employees have a lot of self-service now and information available to them uh, to understand the value of their benefits, to check on their dependents, to check on their beneficiaries. It's, it's um, much easier now and readily available to them to do that. Uh, labor and employee relations is pretty much what it is uh, as far as you know that there's uh, the six unions. But um, many of our, our team work directly with managers, work with employees on their concerns, um, really just trying to emphasize the relationship between employees and the employer uh, here at JJC. And then this is a fairly new area where we're dedicating. We just pivoted some existing staff into HRIS to really support 
um, the work that we're doing with our ERP and some of the process improvements in HR. So our HRIS team is doing you know, data quality and training. They're making job aids. They're doing a ton of testing, uh, new releases, and, and uh, anything we want to um, modify in the system. We have a sandbox environment, so they go in and, and check all of that. Uh, analyzing reporting data, and this is working well. We, we started with one um, individual, and we've added a second person just reallocating within our department over to this function. So, And they provide a lot of end user support as well. People say, I don't know how to check my leave balance, or I, you know, I want to know more about A, B, and C in the system. So um, on that note, with, with our new ERP, I just wanted to talk about some of the things we've seen in HR and the benefits that we've experienced. First of all, it, it's it's one source now. We have been able to sunset several of our other sources, like our applicant tracking system, our performance management system, other things that were third-party um, separate contracts. They're all in, it's all in one area now. Um, our imaging for employee records. Uh, we have an integration with our background vendor, so it's very seamless when an applicant is joining us. Uh, performance appraisal, as I mentioned, and then coming really soon is our uh, professional development and training. Uh, we've also been able to uh, provide more self-service. Uh, we can build and modify business processes so we're not committed to one workflow for everything if we want to change up who's involved in approving different things. Um, definitely an improved applicant and employee experience. Um, and it ease for employees or, um, sorry, applicants who want to apply for more than one position. Um, they report good things. We do survey our employees, or I'm sorry, we survey our applicants that aren't hired um, to just gauge their experience with the systems, with the interactions with staff to improve on that as well. We've also upskilled our HR team members. Each, each person on the team has a new level of expertise in our system um, and helping and serving our, our employees and students. And of course, improved automation and less paperwork. Uh, some HR trends that you might be experiencing in, in your employers, you know, where you work as well, or just hearing, but there's definitely an emphasis on total well-being. Um, we're doing more programming here, uh, definitely more emphasis. We did our walking wolves again. We have a financial wellness week coming up. Um, just looking to expand that, the mental health services for both our students and our employees. We talked about the applicant and employee experience. Um, remote and hybrid work strategies continue to be something employees, uh, people are looking for. Uh, that commitment and sense of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. You know, employees want to be here and be able to bring their true authentic self to work and feel supported in those efforts. So we, we collaborate and have a lot of joint efforts in that area. And then the upskilling and reshaping of the workplace learning. You know, we, we, we have five generations of workers in, the, in our workplace now, five generations of employees. And we know that people entering the workforce um, need certain skills. People being promoted as first time managers need certain skills. So just reshaping that and how people learn, having different modalities, um, being able to track that and to be able to build that into succession planning and career pathing. So that was my brief presentation but uh, and I just put a couple photos up there we are a team that likes to have fun <laughs> um, but I'm happy to take any questions I do want to mention I also put one of our communication pieces just to celebrate people you know joining the organization being promoted um, we do this JJC destinations it's an internal uh, monthly blast uh, linked in the newsletter just saying hey here's who's who's come on board here's who's leaving here's who's retired Again, just so we can celebrate the whole employment life cycle. I have a quick question, Joe. Yes. So the uh, um, improved applicant employee experience, is this something new since Workday has been implemented? Like to track if somebody um, applies and then they go through the process and they're not selected, is that um, to track their experience, is that new or how long have we been? Well, the survey started shortly before we went to Workday, mm -hmm. so we were doing it from uh, people admin. Okay. Um, but it is... 
uh, more automated now and, and data is more readily available as well. So okay. um, I will mention one of the things that's different too. We have um, an exit interview that, that can um, go to employees as soon as they submit their resignation and work day. Every employee is offered an exit interview and then we try to meet with every full-time employee who's leaving to gather their feedback. But then we can also run a consolidated report of the exit interview responses like that was all paper manual before just to give another example thank you i think that's important because oftentimes i hear that people apply and it's like their application goes into like some dark place and they never ever ever hear anything back so if this is now modified and it's changed then i'm, I'm happy to hear that thank you. thank you i have a question yes you had mentioned on your page of six to nine hundred thousand that we lose or that we pay out every month. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at our latest bill of 867,143.10 and then 88,079.48 for Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Is there any way that we can get a breakdown of what we receive and what our losses are? Because I'm sure that we are taking losses by what we're paying out. Are we not or not? Or am I um, mistaken? It's a 12 month um, forecast or financial plan. So I don't know that we track stuff here um, month by month, like, you know, but we well, have I'm looking at over 900,000. We're approving tonight for just medical. That's not doesn't include dental. It doesn't include vision. How do we know? How much we're really paying out? You've got Gallagher getting in our paid every. In well, what, 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 wait, wait. You've got Gallagher getting paid a fee every month that we're paying for Gallagher, and then I see what our deductibles are, and then I see what we're approving. How do we know where we're at when we're approving these? In the financial reports, mm -hmm. self-insurance fund. So the self-insurance fund, but. That that's money all, that's everything in the self-insurance fund but that money comes from is derived from where from our primarily budget. internally the premium equivalency rate we back charge to the departments for each employee okay. and employee contributions so i'm one that needs to see facts and figures can you put something together to show us what our numbers are to what our losses or what our payments are to what we if we're if we're in a negative situation so when we approve the next thing that gallagher recommends for you can we see what the dollar amounts are because i think that's what we've been asked you know looking at when we're approving these bills almost a million dollars you know each month mm -hmm. so if we can see where it's coming from where the the revenues generated from and what the expenses are that would help yes Thanks. And then as far as Gallagher goes, and you might as well stay up here too, Jeff. As far as Gallagher goes, we pay him what, six to 7,000 a month? I believe it's like 5,600, about 67,000 a year. Does that sound right? Like you say, it's under six, I know that. Yeah, under 6,000 a month. Under 6,000 a month. And that's for them guiding us or guiding the team to make insurance decisions? They um, help and they provide us a lot of data. So their actuarial staff can crunch numbers and help with um, the numbers Jeff needs for budgeting and financial. They also provide quite a bit of just daily support for us. They provide recommendations. Um, they help us with compliance reporting. And do they get any money from any, any other source that we're doing with them other than that? Or do they get some type of a percentage of whatever we do with Blue Cross and Blue Shield? It was disclosed check. at one point, but I don't know off the top of my head. Or what Can we research that, that then? Yeah, I think that we certainly ask that in the RFP process. I just don't know it off the top of my head. If yeah. you could find that out, I think that would be another aid for us to know what's going on since we're approving this every month for Gallagher. So their total revenue that they're making from us on this position with us. Yeah, and the original contract for Gallagher did come before the board at one point um, for approval, and then it's a multi-year contract with a little bit of an increase each year, I think 3%. Thank you, good report. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Sorry. Right. Thank you. Chairman, uh, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge Judy and her leadership. Judy stepped into this role when Dr. Whitehead left, as many of you recall, um, provided a stability, number one, um, and worked really hard to optimize our human resources function. So, Judy, thank you for your leadership in this area. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. 
So 1.2.6, faculty union report, Dr. Bob. The pattern developing here, when I walk up, people walk out. I'm <laughs> <coughs> starting to get a little bit nervous. Uh, I do want to thank HR for all the work they do. Um, obviously, everybody needs a great HR department. and. Uh, and we have one, and uh, we work closely with them. So thank you for that. Um, a I have a couple of quick things here today. I, I won't. I won't keep you long. I promise. Um, I do want to thank uh, Julia Township um, for for that uh, wonderful gift uh, for our students, uh, and uh, it, hopefully that will get some momentum going uh, throughout the uh, throughout the area, and some other people will step up. So. Uh, and also, I don't know, some of you don't know this, that Angel Contreras is actually not only a student here, he worked here for several years too. So, uh, and we used to have a good relationship when he was here. So, um, the other two, th oh, I, I want to say something real quickly about, um, it, it came up on, on the report, just a small item on the report, but the, the DEI initiative, uh, Escortina is here too. Uh, I just want to make one little statement about that. Uh, the whole concept is being distorted uh, in some uh, national uh, conversations. And I think it's really important for us to understand the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, uh, some of these discussions that are taking place are solely designed to confuse and distort and to uh, belittle the concept of DEI. And uh, I hope we, and I know we will remain committed to that here. So, and I hope uh, people who are out there hearing some of that stuff do some of their own research because a lot of people like to do that these days and get some real information on what it actually is. So. Thank you, Dr. Barson. Oh, sure. I should share with you, Bob, too, that the ICCTA, also with the diversity equity committee that we have, they're seeing the same thing and we are working to make sure that it's the same message that's coming across that's the right message. So thank you for bringing that up. Oh, well, I'm glad, I'm glad to see that the ICCTA is working on that, so thank you. Um, there was one other thing I wanna to mention today. It's, it's a sad thing, but it's, I wanted to celebrate um, one of our former uh, an adjunct professor. Uh, when, you, when you teach in, in any department, you get, you know, as a full-time faculty member, you'll meet adjuncts, you'll talk to them occasionally and things like that. You don't get real close to them because they're in and they're out and they're, they're, they're busy people and we are too. But uh, I was really, really uh, devastated uh, when I heard the news about uh, Carl Roach. Uh, such a nice young man. Uh, I saw him not too long ago in a parking lot. Uh, uh, we, I was coming in. I hadn't seen him since the pandemic started. He was leaving. I was coming in. We had a very, a really nice exchange. Just always had nice exchanges with him. And I'm sure he, he was applying for the positions in the English department. And I, and I wished him well. And I didn't realize that'd be the last time I would see him. So, um, it, it. I, I hope you all uh, look him up uh, online. Uh, in uh, his obituary, I know the student newspaper is going to do a, a small. Uh, tribute, uh, uh, it's not that big, but it's going to be something in the next newspaper will be coming out next week. Um, and people should know that uh, we're all a family here. We all work together here. And uh, a loss is, it's a, that's a terrible loss for this institution. Such a nice, pleasant man whose who's students loved him. So uh, I just wanted to say that. Uh, If you, anybody who knows me knows I, I'm, I'm, I'm an emotional guy, but, but I'm fine now, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that and pay attention to that. And do some research, check the obits out, and, um, and let us all uh, look out for each other. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Bob. <clears throat> well, one, two, one point two point seven. Um, we don't have a uh, faculty union report tonight. Um, 1.2.8, Village of Shanahan TIF extension and letter of support. Dr. Farmer. Thank you so much. So good evening, Chairman O'Connell, 
trustees of the board and the members of the JJC community. Um, I just want to make a real quick statement. It, it is not our practice to add agenda items. Um, especially once the agenda has been published. Um, however, we have a special request um, from the village of Shanahan. So at this point, I would like to invite Jeff Heap, including Tom Durkin, the village administrator, um, to talk about the Shanahan TIF extension in a letter of support. Thank you. Good evening, and I'm gonna turn it over to Tom. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> well, good evening, everybody. Um, as Dr. Farmer indicated, my name is Tom Durkin. I'm the village administrator with the village of Shanahan. And here with me tonight is Heather Wagenblatt, our finance director. Um, and as she indicated, we're here tonight to talk about a letter of support for some legislation that is being sponsored by Senator Rezin down in Springfield regarding uh, authorization for the extension of the Auxable TIF district, which has been in place um, since 1999. And and it's set to expire at the end of this year. Um, so the, the reason for kind of being here, um, what I'll say somewhat last minute, is um, the requirements for the uh, legislation to move forward it, in the uh, Senate and then ultimately the House is the concurrence of support from all of the affected taxing bodies. And so that letter... Um, we're in the process of gathering those letters from all the taxing bodies um, by the 24th of March is when they have to be kind of down there for it to get out of committee in the convoluted process it takes to get a bill passed through the state legislature. Uh, so to date, I have four letters in hand and expect the remainder of those letters to come over the course of the next few days and into early next week, uh, probably by uh, the earliest, the 21st. Uh, but in all likelihood, my guess is it'll be right up to the 11th hour before we get all those and then ship those off down to Springfield. So the uh, letter of support at this point does not obligate the uh, support uh, or the it doesn't actually result in an, the extension of the TIF district. It just um, allows the uh, uh, state legislature to move it through the process. The actual extension then comes after the fact through action by the village of Shanahan with concurrence by the uh, all the taxing bodies that are in there uh, through the form of an, an amended redevelopment agreement, um, in this case a tax settlement agreement that'll kind of stabilize the taxes over the course of the extension period, um, as well as the um, uh, intergovernmental agreement between the taxing bodies. So. Um, we appreciate your consideration and hope you can provide us with that letter of support for this next step. Um, and if there's any questions at this point, I think I've covered it all. So I'm happy to answer any. What does that financially do to the college by doing this? Does it impair us at all? So I know we approved something prior to, so what, what are we? Well, this, this particular TIF district goes back to 1999 when it was first established. It was amended in 2012 or 13, I think. End of 12 end of 12, beginning of 2013, by the time yeah. it all got done, um, with some additional uh, uh, improvements that were made by Oxable. And this extension will also take some of those additional dollars that as part of those improvements that weren't covered under the first amended agreement into the second amended agreement for 12 years. So part of this, and what I think what's really important part of this whole thing, is the tax settlement agreement. The tax settlement agreement sets the uh, equalized assessed value of the property and it gives the taxing body some stability over this extension period mm -hmm. because we will know just what we're going to get out of these uh, o over the next 12 years. It includes two 4% uh, adjustments upward in the agreement right now. And uh, I, by the way, those were all provided to Jeff on Friday of last week because we just got them all completed last week. Um, so I'll be back in front of you to talk about those in great detail going forward. Um, but it also, and I think the probably the most important part, it eliminates the opportunity for any, um, uh, the ability of the property owner to um, protest. protest, thank you, <laughs> forgot the word, protest their taxes, which could then result in a reduction in the AV. So stability is the big key and was important to all the taxing bodies um, 
for the joint review board, as well as the local school districts, since they make up the majority of the tax bill, they worked very closely in developing these agreements and making sure that um, they wouldn't be, I, I'll say, hurt by anything that was going to happen by that. What is the college annual that they would receive from this then, too? Jeff, do you know? The surplus distribution, oops, the surplus distribution this past year is about 300000 Does that sound right, Heather? Yeah, because basically right now they're distributing basically all the revenue out of the TIF district. Okay. It's the Oxable Chemical Plant on Route 6. I know. And I mean, it, like I said, this is just being finalized now. It just kind of saw some of the documentation. The plan would be for the IGA and the property tax agreement to kind of bring it through the finance committee yep. that ultimately has to come back to this board to vote on it. And all the local, local taxing bodies have to approve it for really the TIF extension to even happen. Right. Yeah. Is it normal, though, for TIF extensions to go this long? I mean, you're talking over 23 years now. Well, statutorily, TIFs are allowed 23 years by state statute. Right. The extension that uh, is being uh, sought and, and is being uh, proposed on it in Springfield is for a 12-year extension. Okay. That's pretty typical of, and, and every year, pretty much, it seems that the state authorizes extensions of TIF, TIF, TIF districts throughout the state, depending upon which their location and their particular circumstances. And did you go to Sue or did Sue come to you or how did that? So uh, through our discussions, because Sue Resin is, um, well, up until recently, since the district's changed, she's right. just outside of the district now, right. but she worked closely with this project in years past. So it was kind of a logical choice to reach out to her. Um, but we also have reached out to Representative Davis on the House side also, and um, also uh, have Senator Bennett who is now taking over this area. Right, uh, and, and, right, so he's been involved. But as you know, he's been moving from the House over to the Senate. So he's kind of busy mm -hmm. uh, over the last few months. So well, he's out this way quite a bit. We yeah. see quite a bit of him. Yep, he is. He's, he's, uh, he's really engaged. So. Good. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Tom. Great, appreciate it. And I appreciate your support uh, through this next step. And um, I will be back. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you there. <laughs> one point three, one point three point one, approval of the minutes for regular monthly meeting held on February fifteenth, twenty twenty-three. So moved. Second. Second. It's Karen, we have a Hi. roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Trustee Morales. Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Broderick? Aye. Trustee Bozinski? Yes. Trustee Garcia Guillen? Yes. Trustee Mahalik? Yes. Trustee Stamborski? Yes. Trustee O'Connell? Yes. Motion carries. 1.4, approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Oh. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. 1.5, approval of consent agenda as presented. So moved. Second. I'd like to have 3.1, which are the bills, and 3.2.1, which is the network firewall software licensing pulled. I would like to pull real quick um, 3.2.4. Okay, um, I just have a couple things I, or housekeeping rules that I want to say. Per board policy 0 .01 0 .0 0 0.01.45.00, meeting of the board, each trustee is given three minutes for discussion when recognized by the chair. Each trustee will then be allowed two minutes of a rebuttal after each trustee has been given the opportunity to speak. I've been designated the timekeeper, which will be done with my red timer. Karen, I thought you were going to pull some items, too. <laughs> well, you don't want to pull anything, do you? Mm -hmm. Do we need to vote on the other ones? Okay, can we do a vote on the consent agenda? Yes. Okay, so um, Trustee Morales? Yes. Trustee Nancy Garcia Guillen? Yes. Trustee Broderick? Yes. Trustee Bozinski? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Mahalik? Yes. Trustee Stamborski? Yes. Trustee O'Connell? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. 
Okay, we'll start with 3.1. Yes, 3.1. We need a motion first. I'll move. Second. Second. Nancy and Alicia. <clears throat> Trustee Garcia again? Yes. Um, uh, discussion? Yeah. Okay. I was waiting right. for you to say discussion. <laughs> Several items that I have concern. Page one, which is all the AVAP, we're over 250000 Last month I had asked to have them hold off and to see what we are really paying. This is like 250,000. I still would like a breakdown of what our contractual amount is and what all these little extra things are that are being I submitted. So I have a concern there. Page two, I'm looking at your mind, your manners limited, which is basically 30,420 that we're paying Jerome. And I guess my question is, I've asked about the contract issue. Do we not have it stipulated somewhere that we are still paying him over 30000 a month and we're on hold with it, with, with Workday? I'm concerned as to, is there something built into the contract? Because I haven't seen the contract to tell me that we have a hold or we don't have a hold. He's self-employed. Do we not have something that says, you know what, we're on hold, I'll reduce my fees by? Because 30000 times 12 is 360000 a year or more. So I'm looking at that issue then page 16 um i think it was gartner conference uh since we're so into the work day and i know mr sir went to that is there any way we can have some type of a follow-up as to what that was all about all i see is gartner symposium and if gartner is the one that was giving the information to us i'm still trying to figure out where gartner fits in to that um, the other thing was, Maureen, I don't see that. Can you? It's uh, page sixteen. It's under Jim, sir. Okay, I see it. It says some Gartner Symposium Conference in Orlando, Florida. It would be nice if we're going to something that's related to Workday to know what it's all about. Then the next page is page thirty-one, the keynote speaker, and I asked about this only because. It was $3,000, which it was a great, great thing. Do we ever get sponsors to help us defray the cost since we ate the whole thing of the 3000 to help us sponsor that event? Because it was a great event for all of the high schools to be here. But I think we should think about getting sponsors too so that we have, we're not eating the whole cost of it. You mean like from the high schools? Mm-hmm. High schools or businesses or some of our vendors. You know, we do have people to come out that want to support us. It would be nice to have them with their little, you know, contributions to us. And then the other thing I was looking at is our marketing campaign. And I see bills and they're all over the pages. So I'm just going to tell you, um, I'm looking for our return of investment always, but we have snap, Google, PayPal, Facebook, Spotify, Comcast. Is there not some way that we can get a monthly report that tells us what exactly was spent and what our return of investment was and the cost breakdown associated with it? You know, like yes, yeah, snap, you got Google and Kelly, you did a great report for us last time, but if you could fill us in, cause there was a bunch of money that we're approving for it, just so we know where our return of investment is. I don't know that you can really measure return of investment immediately. I think that's going to be seen over over time. You can see what the responses are because these are bills that were private from the previous to see if there's a return yet. Because if they have some sensitivity in identifying if there's anything that's coming up, they can see if it's being utilized or not. But we you, do in banking, so I know that we it's available to do. Are you looking for that to transfer into like registrations? Because it could just be inquiries. And it takes I'm a while to see for how much marketing we're really getting out of it. If there's, if it's really a good pull on it to use it, so, you know. Yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Well, Trustee Broderick, thank you for your questions. Oh, that's it. <laughs> I like it. Three seconds. Oh. <laughs> no, it's uh, so I, I've identified five things. So just to kind of recap, and then we'll get the staff to respond. And I'll probably start over with Dr. Farmer. I think we've got KRT on deck, possibly uh, Roberto, just kind of give you all a heads up. So AVAP, Mind Your Manners, Gartner, uh, Black Teen Summit, and then sort of marketing in general. 
So let's let's start with Dr. Farmer. How Absol shall we approach this? Absolutely. Can I hold yes. off on one yes, thing yes, before because I didn't get to say this. Yes. If Karen Kissel can just give us the iGen because I think that's critical of all the things that we were deducted. I think she needs to be included so everybody knows what iGen is all about. Okay, um, so I, I did also, also Dr. Numuo, document uh, the five uh, deals questions. And so first, so let's start off about AVAP. Um, I do want you to know that Kissel and I, and along with her team, we've been working diligently, um, VC, on um, compiling that information for you. So we hope to have that available as soon as possible. But I do want you to know that I did a little research regarding our AVAP master subscription, um, because the fact that we continue to pull AVAP bills, mm -hmm. I don't want it to become a major concern because we, we have a contract with AVAP. And in, in that contract, it does stay say that we have to pay the bills within a, a certain amount of time within 45 days and so um, and then also we did consult with Carl um, attorney Buck just to get a little bit more insight um, because we don't want the college to be held responsible for not paying bills especially since we have an ongoing contract with AVAP um, so we do also under and, and Carl help me out here I'm trying to see if I can find that information Local Government Prompt Payment Act. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and could you talk a little bit about that, please? Once the bills are presented and uh, approved, then we have 30 days to pay them. If we don't pay them after 30 days, then we get a 1% penalty. So there is a statute out there that requires us to pay bills on time. Now, I don't know that that's necessarily triggered here, but that is a concern. Well, the only reason I'm bringing it up is because what's the true bill? You keep saying bills with a plural. What is really our contract price? So if these are extras, how do I know they're extras or not extras? I don't know that when I'm looking at all these things. This is over 250000 that's on our month this month. So where is the deviation between this is the contract that you sold us when we approved it in 2019? What, was, what are all these additionals that keep coming up? That's what I asked for last month. Please provide us with a breakdown. I still don't see that breakdown yet. I just see more bills. Well, it's my understanding there there are no additionals. This is a part of the contract, the original contract. So all of these are individual bills that are in the contract that calls for this in the contract? That is my understanding. And Jim, if you have a little bit more insight, you can help, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farmer. Yes. Chairman O'Connell, Board of Trustees, Dr. Namul. Um, so all of the bills as presented are part of uh, the contracts and the purchase orders uh, that we've created on the system. Those bills basically fall into four buckets. So for our HR and finance implementation, um, all of the uh, hours are time and materials based for HR and finance. Uh, we are within uh, the budget as approved by the board for our H, uh, HR and finance implementation. The second bucket of ours is a fixed fee for our student implementation. Um, we are within the board approved uh, uh, budget for our student fixed fee uh, implementation. And then there's two other buckets of ours that are both time and materials. One is for AMS, which is our post go live support service with AVAP. That is a monthly uh, support service, 75 hours a month. We pay as you go, so if we don't use those 75 hours, we don't get charged for those hours. Those hours then get carried forward into subsequent months as part of that uh, contract. And then the last one is for our uh, PRISM Analytics implementation. That is also time and material, so we are only charged for those hours that are utilized uh, for that project. Uh, as it stands, we're about $50,000 under budget on our PRISM anal uh, Analytics implementation uh, we are doing additional work uh, on that project currently as well. But wasn't PRISM added after? PRISM was added after I think the board approved that in December of 2021. And then when I'm looking at the 101,215, 64, 61, which is over 200,000 for the student recruiting and admissions, mm -hmm. that falls under the student module then? Yeah, it's the and fixed that we don't fee. have the full module That's of? the fixed fee for the student implementation. We went live with student recruiting and admissions in October of 2021. And then since then, we've been working on the student phase two implementation. So that is a fixed fee per month cost that goes through November of 2023. But is that inclusive of the whole student module? It is. 
So we're getting overcharged for pieces that we don't have that they never gave to us. We're not getting overcharged at this point. We're still very much in the implementation as part of that contract. But my concern is this is supposed to be for all of the student module that we do not have all of the student module. Correct? We, are, we are not live currently, correct. But we're still getting charged 200000 or more. For these. It's $101,000 per month. That right. was that was that payment schedule was laid out as part of that fixed fee contract. So we didn't negotiate anything to get this reduced because we don't have the full module. We have not as of yet. We're waiting for the IV and V process to complete this month. I think that's due to wrap up around April 1st with a report coming to the board. So um, until we get the, the results of that report and then make subsequent decisions, we will. I expect have further conversations on that topic. Correct. Vice Chair Broderick, any additional questions regarding AVAP at this point? The I think just one point of clarification, too. Yeah. There were six of these invoices on last month's bills list. Mm -hmm. So six of the invoices listed there of the 10, I believe, Correct. are from February. The PRISM uh, modules that we added that were extra, how long was the contract on those? Was that also a 10-year contract? It was uh, PRISM Analytics and Adaptive Planning were co-terminated to our original contract with Workday. So the total Workday subscription was 10 years. Uh, at the time that we added PRISM and Planning, I think it was about eight and a half years uh, for those applications that were co-terminated with our 10-year subscription. Can we get a breakdown where the time and material funds are going to? Are we still spending time and material money on a project we're not going forward with right at this time? There's still project that we have slowed the pace of the project down considerably. There still are activities going on. Anything that's related to the student implementation is part of that fixed fee contract currently. But we can provide any, I know there's a, a spreadsheet with six different tabs that's been circulating around that we've all been, been working on and providing input on. Well, you mentioned that if we don't use it, we're not being billed for it. And we're in a, I'm thinking we're in a cost recovery situation here versus throwing money at something that's not working. Is there any exposure to the cut or the time and material that we can pull back on and save the campus some money? That's what I'm looking for. So I'd like to see where the time and material money is going to. If it's going to something we know right now in November, we're not moving forward with, I'd like to stop spending money on it now. So the short answer to that is everything that's time and material are for things that are either working or in progress. The student implementation, which is where we have uh, the issues that we've we've been discussing, is the fixed fee uh, project. It's not the time and materials component. And yet Jerome is still getting paid for all of this stuff, even though some of it's on hold, correct? Dr Jerome continues to, to do work on the project for um, data conversion, data validation, integrations, reports, uh, and other project work that is uh, still ongoing. How often is he on premise? He uh, works mostly remotely right now. He comes on site as needed. As you've seen, he's been at the, at the last couple of board meetings. He comes on for larger group meetings and things of that nature. So he, uh, he bills us by the hour for his time, but that's all part of the board approved contract with Mind Your Manners. Jerome is not self-employed. He works for Mind Your Manners. Are there, understandably, we are under contract. Under, I, we understand that we have to go through. Is there anything with what Budzinski was saying that we can pull back on without breaking contract that is not going to hurt the systems that are already in place? I would say at the moment, no. I think as we get through the IV and V process and get more of that information, I think we can make some decisions at that point. Okay. Can we then see something in regards to what Jerome submits every month for his pay? Sure. So that we yes. see what so that we see what this big yes. huge thirty thousand yeah. is all for since we're on hold. Not a problem. Yes. And how long was Jerome? You get a fully detailed time report mm -hmm. from Jerome. So how long was Jerome's contract? It runs right now through August. September. September of 2023. And for the April workshop, can we see the breakdown in the time and material expenses? Mm -hmm. It depends. We can do that, certainly. Um, or by May. I just, you know, I'm uncomfortable approving something every month that's, I'm being told it's time and material, and if we don't use it, we don't spend it. 
But right yeah. now, I'm in the mode of let's stop spending on this. So I'd like to have a better idea of what I'm saying no to. We have a so. fully detailed report of the time and materials hours and descriptions. I guess my question is, Trustee Budzinski, over what period of time do you do you want that information? It just go back a month. I'm, I'm not looking for a yeah. complete history. We know where we're at right now. All I want to know is when we look at the, you know, to look at a bill this month for time and material, I, in my mind, representing this community, want to know that this is money that's well spent. Sure. It may be we need every dollar we're spending on it, and I'm hoping that's what the case is. But as trustees voting on these bills, this is a hidden for us. Sure. You know, anytime we hear, well, if we don't use it, you know, or we don't spend it, well, we're in the do not spend right now. So I like to compare things. Do you, can we have two months? Sure. We have all that information now. So that's, that's easy. We can provide. Okay. May I ask the, just to make sure I fully <clears throat> understand what's going on is that we're, we still are working to implement workday and there are costs associated with that. We're also underneath the contract. There are costs associated with that. What's being asked here is, are we spending additional money on things that we don't need right now? Correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Just, just making sure, just sure. being clear with that. Well, it took 20 okay. seconds and ruined our five minute conversation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And um, Vice Chair Broadway, you had one more question about Gartner, the conference, correct? Right. And Jim, sir, if you would like to respond to that, please. Sure, Dr. Farmer. So as part of the Monday questions and response, I did provide additional information on the on the Gartner IT Symposium Conference. I don't know if you saw I did see the it, description. I, wanted, I want to hear what the whole total thing was, because that was who we, that you guys used in regards to getting Jerome. And I want to hear more of what the symposium was really all about. Yeah, so the Gartner Conference is, has nothing to do with Workday. Um, the Gartner Annual IT Symposium is a conference of 10,000 IT leaders and professionals across their customer base. It's once a year. It's an annual conference. In fact, this is the first time I've, at I've uh, attended symposiums since prior to the pandemic. So the first time actually getting back out. It's a week-long conference, uh, tracks for CIOs and other IT professionals around a, a variety of topics. They usually roll out their top trends uh, in higher education for both business and for technology. So it's it's an annual Gartner conference about a wide range of, of uh, technology topics. Other CIO professionals gather there to network, share information, talk about things that they're implementing at their institution. So it's a great opportunity to get out there and learn from our peers, see what they're doing, go through you know training and sessions, um, best practices, uh, things of that nature. So. And by the way, you said it's all of you guys talking and sharing. Did anything come up about ERP systems? Because it seems to be a hot topic with all of us when we were in DC and ICCTA. You guys are CIOs. Did that come up as a topic? Yeah, we talked quite a bit about that. There are sessions, of course, dedicated to ERP and the modernization of ERP systems and technology. Uh, certainly that's a part of, uh, of the symposium conference. There's a lot of, uh, of activity outside of the sessions with CIOs, especially CIO, CIOs that are going through or considering similar modernization efforts, ERP system upgrades, student system upgrades, people that are in implementations, considering implementations, have gone through implementations. So it's a great opportunity to kind of all of us get together uh, and learn from each other, uh, talk about things that have worked, that haven't worked, what their obstacles have been, how they've overcome those, uh, things of that nature, certainly. And can you share that with us at the retreat then so that we can hear what some of the outcomes were? Because it would be interesting for us to hear what the outcomes of those, you know, gatherings were. Sure. Yeah. Happy to do that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe we had one more question regarding the holistic um, equity leadership consultant for the Black Teen Summit. I'll have uh, Vice President Valadez come up to respond to that question. Thank you. Now, mind you, this was all positive. I'm just I know, I know. To Great question. Help with Great the question. sponsoring because yes. we have people out there, companies out there that would definitely help. <coughs> and we had over 400 students participating. We in did. It was a great gathering. We can probably get some sponsoring from your bank next one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh I, I was waiting for that one. <laughs> So Very thank good. you for the question. It's actually a really good question because we ought to be engaging with private partner, pri you know, uh, public, uh, public, um, private partnerships. We got two thousand uh, dollars 
uh, for this uh, event from the, and I'm, uh, let me quote it here. Just want to get the National Hookup for Black Women oh, sponsored uh, to, the event by, by providing us with $2,000. But see, that's good to know because when you see the $3,000, you're like, mm -hmm. okay, do we have any sponsors? If they did, that would be great to have something on the program that says sponsored by so yeah. we know who's contributing because that's a good thing. To as, know. I, as I understand it, the uh, the sponsoring was in our in our um, um, marquee. So, mm -hmm. well, I guess I didn't see. I was present, so I didn't see it. So, I guess I'm just looking for more visibility. If that be the case, absolutely. absolutely. And like Dr. Farmer said, we actually um, brought in 360 students from our local high we schools. Uh, we're looking forward to bringing some of those students as enrollees within the next couple of, couple of years. Yeah, it, was a, so. it was a great gathering. Very good, and the keynote speaker was very good too. And the Latinx Empowerment Summit is coming up in, in about a month, month. so yeah. we're looking for sponsors. <laughs> see, see, see. Got to do. Got to do your job, sponsor Rick. plug. Thank you. Have one more, one more question. Yeah. So, vi Vice Chair, anything else at this point? I believe we covered everything. Marketing. The only thing was the iGen thing. iGen, okay. That I think that Karen Kissel did a great job explaining it to me. I know it's there, but I think publicly, so everybody understands what iGen is really about. Because we had all the community colleges, and even the U of I, that we were writing checks for. But we also have a profit that we make by being the sponsor of it. Yes. And I didn't know what iGen was, what the initials were. So, as she as she shared, as I shared with her, what does it mean? Okay. Okay, uh, Vice President Kissel. Okay. You have a request. I'm just going to read off the response, but iGen is the Illinois Green Energy Network, and yes. it's a collaboration of all the community colleges that was established in 2008, and it was designed to drive the growth of both green energy industry and its workforce. A few years ago, JJC agreed to serve as a fiscal agent, and so we, you'll see funds that are being spent through JJC on behalf of us being the fiscal agent. We get $100,000 a year to be the fiscal agent. Um, the grant for FY23 was $2 million, and it's funded by the state of Illinois. Great. Thanks, Karen. I think we just should all know what it is, because if we did make 100000 by being it, I'm seeing all these checks written out to all these different colleges going, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. So it makes more sense. You know, thank you. Okay, so anything else? Can we be the agent for other states as well? At a hundred grand a state, we can make some money. It would be nice. No, and I, I address profit. my concern to we Kelly okay. about the marketing. So I think she knows where that's at. All right. Okay, so I want to move on to Trustee Stemborski. You had a question regarding 3.24 consortium furniture for mental health. It's more more like a comment. Okay. Um, yes. I was very exceptionally happy to see. 3.2.4 go through, which is the cons which is the consortium for furniture for the mental health space. Um, even though there aren't like big Can plans. Can I pause right you now. for one second, Josh? I apologize. We have to take a vote on 3.1. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're jumping. Yeah. I know. Right. Slow your roll. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, Trustee Garcia again. Question, do we need to make a modification in order to remove the two items that we talked about, uh, A, B, A, A, P, and mind your manners? I don't, they were not being removed. No. Well, the thing is, can we vote on, because my vote on all the bills would be no if we can't remove those two. Well, it's only on... That well, ABAP that's up and to the board. I mean, if we you are under remove... contract, and if we do not pay the bills, we can be up for litigation. So I would just, you know, pay them guys like well, I still think we're we should, under there's nothing we can do about it right now I still think mind your ma manners could be removed because I think that should be brought to Jerome as to we're paying him three hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year but we're under contract more I understand we're under contract us. but does the contract not hold for any any visits to the fact if we decide to hold back doing something that's I'd like to see what he's actually doing well let's look at his contract before we make it really irresponsible decision to not pay it that could cause us to become to go to litigation so if we want to do that then we'll go and we'll pull ask to pull the paperwork we'll come we'll look at the contracts and we'll revisit that next month okay so i would offer sorry go ahead i'm holding back okay um so i would offer just uh maybe one thing for the board to consider as as jim mentioned ref referred to the uh iv and v process and the timeline of that is yes, it will be completed. They've got an ambitious agenda and they're moving forward. Uh, we're looking to schedule and Karen will be in touch with all of you, <clears throat> excuse me, a special session on April 5th 
to present the full findings of the IVNV report, anticipate things will change um, as a result. Additionally, um, I anticipate a closed session under 2C1 um, in regards to some of our contractual obligations with all of the entities related mm -hmm. to our ERP. Um, I anticipate that happening either before the April 5th meeting or before the April 12th meeting, at which point we'll ask the board to uh, take a series of actions in regards to the ERP. Okay. Okay. So the contractual review is underway. Oh, for Will right. that fall under any legal issues then, Carl? It could. But I, I don't know that right now. Hence 2C1. Mm -hmm. Motion to approve the bills for this month. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Um, Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Garcia again? Yes. Trustee Broderick? What am I, what are we approving? All the bills? Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. No. Trustee Bozinski? Yes. Trustee Mahalik? Yes. Trustee Morales? Yes. Trustee Stamborski? Yes. Trustee O'Connell? Yes. Motion carries. Oh, there, there, there's two more just for clarification 3.2.1 which is the network firewall software licensing and then 3.2.4 which is the one i believe josh was talking about so let's continue with josh because you whichever one you want to do first we just need a motion so say which one you want to do and we'll do a motion i don't want to interrupt josh's flow so let's <laughs> use 3.2 something to say about chronological order but we, we just we just need a motion on it so if somebody make a motion in a second then we can have discussion. So moved. yes second Alicia and Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good. All right. I'm good. Um, I was just really, when I was reading through the board packet the other night, I was very happy to see the um, furniture go through for the mental health space. Even though it's not a completely resolved plan right now, um, I'm very glad to see that the allocations are being made for this space as it's an incredibly important resource for the students. Um, and though I might not be here to see that, I'm very, very glad to see it moving along. Thank you. Thank you. Can I make it the <clears throat> proposal that we call it the Stamborski Lounge? <laughs> yeah. You want to name it after him, right? Yes. Yeah, so. Okay, are we ready to vote? We're yeah. ready. Yes. Uh, Trustee Morales? Yes. Trustee um, Garcia again? Yes. Trustee Broderick? Aye. Trustee Bozinski? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Mihalik? Yes. Trustee Stamborski? Yes. Trustee O'Connell? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Correct. Motion to discuss 3.2.1. Second. Second. Okay, my question comes in. 593438 for the contract for three years. You had 583 ones that was submitted to, 392 vendors for BEP, and we only got one bid in. Mm -hmm. What was the cost of this before? Who had it before and what was our cost? Because I don't have a comparison to say this is a good price or not a good price because I don't see any vendors selected. So what was our cost last for this last time? Well, Jim, sir, or Matt, any insight of the cost associated with this before? One's a one-year cost, one's a three-year cost. And, uh, Chairman, uh, yeah. Steve Broderick, I, th I think what I'd also like to do is just um, also invite Jim at some point to just kind of talk about the overall um, apparatus, the the what, what's involved in uh, in the firewall. Uh, I understand the firewall. I'm looking at the cost because mm -hmm. I think we should have some comparison. We don't have a comparison. I got one vendor that said, "Here's what you're getting," and we're supposed to vote on it. I don't know what last year's costs were. Well, let him tell us. I am. I don't know either. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so, no, what I can do is I can probably try and look it up while Jim's stalling for time talking about the firewall. But, um, no, I don't know. I will tell you, though, yeah, it's always disappointing when you only get one bid in. It yeah. was a fair bid. It was, you know, the company submitted a, a, a bid in response to our, um, to our solicitation. 
you know, there's no reason to reject it. I do believe it's the same company that we've been using. So, yeah. Um, so I can look that up and probably give you that information as long as it's available, as I believe it probably is. Then can you do us a favor next time so I don't have to keep asking these types of questions? If you could put in that this was the vendor we had before and the cost it was before, and this is the escalation of inflation, that would resolve this and it could have stayed in the consent agenda. But without us knowing that information, I'm sitting here batting at flies, not knowing if I'm hitting them or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can give you some more information. Because I think more information needs to be in these things. I don't disagree with you. We're actually looking at that. So kind of stay tuned. We've th been thinking about changing the format of them anyway to include a little bit. I would highly more. recommend that because you're going to have us looking at these high cost issues and you want us to go into a three-year contract. I got to know something before I even agree to it. And I'll let you look it up while Jim talks. Just uh, one piece of additional information on this one. Kodalski was our previous uh, vendor or reseller for the software subscription. Uh, we had a five-year contract uh, previously, so this is a three-year renewal of our software subscription licensing and support. Um, the reason why we probably only have one vendor that responded is because Palo Alto is the firewall manufacturer. Kudelski is the reseller of the software uh, subscri uh, subscription licensing and support. And so what Palo Alto does and what other large manufacturers do is that they will designate a specific reseller as the partner of record for JJC. So that is more than likely why we only have one response to this bid is because Kudelski is the partner of record by the manufacturer Palo Alto for the college and they only have one vendor set up to do that then they have probably multiple vendors across the country but in our region and for our account Kudelski has been named the partner of record do we have that known to us so you can see that so it could be printed here that they're the only vendor that would have been yeah we we can add that information into the, into the write-ups yeah because otherwise for sure you know you, you're getting up here to have to explain things if they could have been on the paper and I could have read that sure. I wouldn't have had these questions no problem is that just a pass-through cost for Palo? Or are they the ones who determine the cost of the upgrade license and Kodelsky just administers it? Kodelsky's marking it up okay. a certain percent for sure. And how are we doing with the cost back there? No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I have a ballpark number in my head, but I'm curious. going to take a little bit more time sorry what's, what's, i'll we can try and get that information for you i think you should before this gets approved so i would ask that anybody that made the motion rescind it and uh delay till next month so that we can get the information on it since it's only a one bid issue what are the implications of that jim I'm, mm -hmm. yeah, you do. what are the implications software renewal on this is not till july 1st so if the board would like to delay it a month i don't think it would be a huge impact i mean the sooner the better so we can plan appropriately get get contracts executed in time so all of this stuff uh we don't have any disruption of we course at the special board meeting on april 5th that you're proposing to is that enough time that's enough that's uh, just going to be a, a we, we could we're squeezing a lot in on that day what i my question is if we the I, i'm not quite sure why we're not approving it i what further questions you really need we know that there's only one from basically what i've been explained is here's the company that makes the technology here's the money company that they have designated to us because they are the largest company and that's why there's only one bid as far as the money goes if that's if there's only one bid then that's the only person who can do this service for us or that's willing to do this service for us i really don't understand why we would yeah. push it out or have a longer talk or more meetings about this because i think we should have more information provided to us when we're making that decision because if you're fiscally conservative you're not going to just pay out 593 438 10 for three years which is a total of what 240 a year i'm sorry i can't approve something unless i know more information and that should have been provided to us jim you know more about technology than i do do you think that it's a big deal do you think we need more information or should i so palo is most likely the person that is receiving the money for the license upgrade. Like Mr. Sir said, 
there may have been a markup for the vendor that does it. Palo doesn't have an on the street workforce working in this area. So they'll have agencies throughout the country and those agencies are just gonna pass through the cost. And like Jim said, there may be a markup. What we don't know is what that markup is. Odds are if they're the only agency license for that company to work in this area there wouldn't be a lot we could change unless we had a competitive bid but it would still have to be a license that was ended up being sent to palo in some form since it's their product so not that our hands are tied we have a choice between one year and three year as much details we can throw into the proposal it won't change the pricing yeah i would offer i think uh, matt just pulled up the board award from five years ago which was a total of 700 and $746,000 approximately for a five-year contract, which puts it at right about $150,000. So if you consider cost escalation, enhanced product uh, functionality, the cost of cybersecurity technology uh, is increasing rapidly for everything related to cybersecurity, firewalls, all of the things that we do here at the college to protect uh, our infrastructure here, the cost, we're seeing the cost rise pretty dramatically. Uh, we seen last year our cybersecurity breach ins uh, insurance almost doubled last year. Organizations across the globe are seeing the same thing. Uh, we expect to see another increase. We're upon our renewal for that cybersecurity breach uh, insurance here in the next uh, month or so. Uh, but we, we expect to see a pretty significant increase again. So uh, higher education industry is one of the top targeted industries for cyber attacks. Uh, and so uh, we have to be diligent uh, in this area uh, to protect the college's mission critical informa uh, information assets, our faculty, our staff, and our students. Maureen, why didn't we go I'm, with a five year instead of a three year? If that's what we had prior to, why didn't we go with a five year? The company offered us a three year. They did not offer us a five year. We didn't, we didn't go back to see them. You didn't go back and ask for it? There's another answer on, on that uh, question as well, which is the current underlying firewall hardware has an, uh, an end of life coming up in three years. So we wanted to match the three year renewal of the software with the expected end of, uh, end of life with the hardware. And that's why we went with three years. Are you expecting to change companies then because of that? We will uh, have to go out for RFP again on the firewall hardware itself here in the next couple of years. And there's an opportunity for other companies to provide uh, bids for the college's firewall technology. Mm -hmm. But are we restricted to only this Palo Alto? We are not, no. So I guess that's where my question comes in. Well, this, let me clarify. We are restricted to them today Why? because of the underlying Palo Alto firewall hardware, and we need the software subscription licensing and support that goes with that uh, firewall hardware. But if we come up in three years, you're going to have to look at all new hardware software for this whole thing then? we have to do that regardless it does because it's it, it, yes. it's ending it's i understand fire. i understand so with that ballpark cost a lot significantly because I mean, you're including hardware i know if you look at the hardware too if you look at the previous five-year contract it was seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. you can expect a million dollars north of that for something similar three years from now I would expect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so going forward on things like this, you can give us more information so we're not hunting and pecking during the meeting For to sure. get that information. I'll approve it as it is, but next time, please have all this information on this so that we don't have to keep, you know, having you guys go back and forth to look yeah, for it. sure. No problem. Thank you. I respect all of your questions, Maureen. I really appreciate it. I think we all have a better idea about the process and what's going on here and why there was only one bid. Um, with that being said, I am going to motion to approve this bill. Second. Second. There already was a motion, a second. Yeah. Now there's two. There's three. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Maureen, real quick, you didn't ask these questions before the board meeting? Yeah, I know. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> that could have been helpful, I did. too. I pulled it out. I you could you could have sent an email, like, on I, Friday. I, I pulled it out. OK. He knows right. I did. I did it at my luncheon with him. Mm-hmm. We've heard enough. Ready ready places to go. That's yeah. a hint. We're ready for a vote. <laughs> Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Garcia Guillen? Yes. Trustee Broderick? Aye. Trustee Bozinski? Yes. Trustee Mahalik? Yes. Trustee Morales? Yes. Trustee Stamborski? Yes. Trustee O'Connell? Yes. Motion carries.
Yeah. All right. <clears throat> we got a treasurer's report. Uh, so All under consent. consent. Okay. Uh, and no, no financial report. 3.5 approval of old National Bank operational agreement. So moved. Second. Second. <clears throat> Trustee Broderick? Aye. Trustee Stamborski? Yes. Trustee Bazinski? Yes. Trustee Garcia Aguian? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Mahalik? Yes. Trustee Morales? Yes. Trustee O'Connell? Yes. Motion carried. 3.6 approval of easement of the Olympic Boulevard and Hobolt Road. So move. Second. Can we please have somebody explain what we're actually doing for the easement? We're we're not really doing anything for the easement. I think we're giving off like wait, 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 wait one point five acres, Matt. Is that what it is? For it or and they're, they're they're buying it at fair market value, right? Yeah. Do you want me to address that, Trustee? Yes. Yes. This is a road widening project by the City of Joliet. And they are seeking a uh, partial permanent easement and a temporary easement for construction mm -hmm. to widen the road at Hobart and Olympic. Okay. Um, and so part of that is on, they're going through all the property owners along Olympic and, and that area. And so part of that is JJC property. So they have to compensate the college for the road widening. Uh, so that's what this is for, so that they can widen the road and put the public improvements in. And how much are we getting for the acreage that we're supplying? Well, the, uh, their appraisal came in uh, very high at about $70,000 an acre. Uh, the average appraisals in the area for uh, other properties that are being condemned are somewhere in the low 40s to low 50s. Mm -hmm. So their offer was very was high. And, yeah, well, I shouldn't say very high. It was very fair, mm -hmm. you know, for the property that they were taking. And it, um, in consultation with facility services, that's part of our process. It's not going to impact college services. So they didn't have an objection to it from a mechanical perspective. So then it's just a process perspective and their offer was fair. So. And we're not going to lose any egress or egress. Or oh no, it's going, to, it's going to enhance it. It's all part of the uh, Hobart road widening and their ability to service there. So, so it's we'll going still to, have the ingress and egress. Oh yeah, for sure. Got it's it. going to be improved. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't refer Carl first off. He's to, to go to guys. I knew you knew it, though. Where do these funds end up? Well, they'll come into the, I mean, I'll say it poorly because if Jeff's here, he can probably answer, but oh. I would say the general fund because they're just, it's payment for land, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All right, Trustee Mahalik. Yes. Trustee Garcia Guillen. Yes. Trustee Broderick. Aye. Trustee Bazinski. Yes. Trustee Lee. Yes. Trustee Morales. Yes. Trustee Stamborski. Yes. Trustee O'Connell. Yes. Motion carries. <coughs> New old business 4.1. Tuition waivers for JJC classes for part time non union. And for, I was, I briefly go over them. Okay. For everyone. Okay. Uh, so the first reading of the board policies, 4.1.1, tuition waivers for JJC classes for part-time non-union employees, states that part-time non-union employees are eligible for tuition waivers. 4.1.2, certification to return to work, states the requirements to return to work following a prolonged period of illness. When you're looking at the tuition waiver one, Mm -hmm. Do you put any requirements that it has to be a C or better for the waiver to be there and no dropping? There, that is not in the policy, no. It actually states that in the policy, even if they are fired, that they still keep that, uh, they still keep the, tu the tuition waiver. So then I guess my question is going to come back, and I'll inc include Judy in on this. If they decide to drop it and they get a tuition waiver, do they still get charged for that class? And if the class then gets considered not enough students and the class gets dropped, what's the, the offset of that? 
not sure I understand the second part, but the first second part, part is okay, let me let me second part so you understand it is you have fifteen students yeah. and you have to have a minimum of fifteen students. But this one decides to drop it. Now you're down to fourteen. The class is considered dismissed because you don't have enough students in the class. Yeah, I'd have to talk to probably academics to understand if the class if that impact. Um, generally, what we've seen though, the people that ap apply for the tuition waiver and the, st uh, the employees that are taking the classes are pretty serious about it. I don't think there's a ton of that dropping. Um, but we did incorporate that suggestion when we um, developed our tuition reimbursement. So th this is regarding waivers for JJC classes. Right. But we also implemented last year if people are pursuing their um, bachelor's, master's, PhD, we can give them up to $2,500 a year. Mm -hmm. And that one, we do have a requirement of a C or better. So that's upon completion. This was really no, um, there's no cash exchange. There's, um, we don't track it to see that they've completed. And if they do leave employment um, after they've started the class, they can finish the semester. And I have a, we have a whole um, report from the uh, student accounts and payments on how, uh, the tuition waivers are used if you'd be interested in that. Like so do they employees. get the tuition waiver as soon as they start the class? It has to be done before they register. They come to HR, we verify that they're an employee, we sign off on it, and then they take it to um, student to registration. Or, I think they've registered, HR signs it, and then they go to the bursar's office, student accounts and payments. To, hmm. okay. But this is the first reading. Yeah. So. If she wants more information, I'm sure they can get it to you by next month. Mm -hmm. Right. That would be great if you can come up here because nobody can hear you when you're sitting in the audience. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Yeah, Dean West. <laughs> just, just for a clarification, were you asking if if that employee slash student dropped while the class was going on or before the class started? While the class was while going the class on, class was going on. We would never cancel it, but we based never on cancel it, we would never cancel a class if we decide to run a class before it starts. A lot of variables go into that, but there's generally, yes, a minimum to run it so right. the college doesn't take a loss. But um, once that class starts, uh, you don't factor in drops for, for canceling that class because it's already going on and that would punish the other students that were, were actively involved in that class. Well, that's good to know because we had heard, I, had, I should say I had heard that there was classes when we had someone that had dropped out that was a student trustee prior to, not you, Josh. Mm -hmm. And that was the question that came up because this trustee wanted an A or better. And if he didn't get an A or better, he dropped the course. So mm -hmm. there are certain things that just stick that people have told us, you know, and that's why you get yeah, concerned. A but if you're not going to cancel the class, then that's fine. Yeah, we, we wouldn't cancel class once it started uh, out of respect for the other students. Yep. Right. Thanks, yep. Josh. Yep, no problem. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Moving on. 4.3 um, the policy committee is requesting the approval of the tuition waiver for student trustee policy today as a first read so that the policy will be in effect for the newly elected student trustee next month. And this one I did bring up about the student waiver for student student trustee, tu tuition waiver for student trustee. I don't see a grade requirement or no dropping. And I think that Dr. Farmer said that that you, Mr. Valdez, were going to get up and talk about this because I think if we're going to have somebody taking a class and they're getting it for free and they're being a student trustee, and I know Josh would never do this. Josh has good <laughs> grades. I just want to make sure that we have that momentum still going, that there's good grades to achieve this. He'd be teaching halfway through the semester. I know, I know. If we can, um, it's an action item. So if we can get a motion in a second mm -hmm. and then have our discussion, I think that'd be appropriate. Mm -hmm. So moved, second. Discussion. Well, thank you again for that question. Um, just wanna, so I'm new at this. I just wanna make sure that, um, so in the last paragraph here, it's uh, recipients must meet the criteria of enrollment in academic and student conduct standards for the office. Mm -hmm. As outlined in the student trustee qualifications and selection procedure, and then when I looked up that procedure, it points us to the Illinois trustee. So if you uh, give me additional time, I'll work with Carl to find out the specific language in regards to the criteria, the specific criteria, because I know it's in there. I just got to find it for you. 
I think we need to do that because from what I understood from the other ICCTAs that they do have criteria identified for grades specifically and no, no ability to dismiss the class. So if they're getting a D, they can't dismiss it. And if they get a D, then they don't get, they have to pay for that class. And there is language in the policy itself here that um, if the student end up, ends, up, ends, up, ugh, ends up dropping the class, that student will be liable for paying for that class mm -hmm. unless there's an extreme circumstance. Then I ask that that be added before it, we do the approval on it. it it's in here. It is? It mm -hmm. is here. Yeah. In your 1.35.00.01? Um, yeah. Talking about the grades. Are, if the position the is vacated part. before That's the end the of the grade yeah. part. Or the grades, there is a certain level of GPA that I would need to maintain to, let's say that I was the next student trustee next year, which I'm not going to be. But okay. I would need to maintain a certain level of GPA. So let's say for a 3.0. Um, that would be required for me to enter this office and to get this to get the um, tuition waiver that would be required for me to um, I would need to have that GPA to get so what's your GPA requirement um, minimum honestly, honestly minimum. I don't have it off the top of my head I thought it was like a three point I believe it's 3.0 yeah I thought it was a 3.0 3.0 would be the C then correct I well that's no, that's considered that's a, a B. B that's a B that's then? a B yeah. okay I'm just asking that's okay hmm? 2.0 2.0 is? Yes. The Board of Trustees of what's in front of you is the policy, the high-level policy, but we do have a procedure mm -hmm. that um, speaks about the GPA, the requirements, et cetera, that is through um, the Code of Student Conduct Area, Office of Student Rights and Responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is just the policy. Just wanted to stress that today. Got it. Well, I just was looking for grade requirements and no dropping. So if that's included in your procedural part mm -hmm. and it what is. it is for the student trustee, maybe if having that attached would have helped understood what the procedural part was. You give us it, but I don't see what it is. And we can share that with you as well. Thank you. And also in the student trustee policy for mm -hmm. the grade. Um, are we voting on 4.3? I, yes. 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 Yeah. Um, before we do so, I am going to abstain from that vote. I just want to explain why it is because that it kind of serves as a little bit of a conflict of interest for me. Yeah. But I want to make sure. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, I, it serves as a little bit of a conflict of interest for me. I wouldn't see any of this, but it's still kind of weird for me to vote on this. So I'm just not going to vote on it anyways. But I want to make sure that my support is not for this motion is not um, misheard as this is incredibly important as an equity problem for the student body. So I like thank you for the board for um, seeing this item. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. We ready to vote? Yes. Yes. Hey, Trustee Morales? Yes. Trustee Garcia Guillen? Yes. Trustee Broderick? Aye. Trustee Bazinski? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Mahalik? Yes. Trustee Stamborski? Stain. Trustee O'Connell? Yes. Motion carries. 4.4, .4. agenda request by a trustee. And we have something. Um, can I just read or... some, can I just read the policy or some information, a little housekeeping? Please. Um, per port. Per board policy 01.45.01, agenda, prep, agenda preparation, which states any trustee may request that an item be placed on the future board agenda. The agenda item requested by the trustee allows the board to discuss the agenda item being requested. It will then be determined by, it will then be determined by a non-binding majority poll whether to direct the president to add the requested item to a future agenda. Due to the fact that we had a forensic audit and it called for an inventory issue, can we please have that put on the agenda to see what the inventory uh, policies, procedures are so that we can review and look at them? Because I think that's come up with the Renaissance Center now that we've changed over to the Renaissance Center with a new uh, tenant to make sure we're following and doing that there's actually been an inventory compared to what it was before so that there is totally a crossover of understanding what we had, what was sold, and what's there now. And I'm bringing that up as a concern, but as a topic. Yeah, Trustee Broderick, thank you. And Dr. Farmer, can you talk a little bit more about that if you're able to do so? You know, I, um, so I want to get a little bit more clarity from you. Um, so when you say inventory, are you talking about asset control inventory? Asset control, which okay. came up in the forensic audit, yes, which showed that we didn't have 
a good for a good asset control. Yes. Yeah. So I'm asking to see that we can all see that and see what it involves so that we are all aware of what the inventory assets are at okay. the time. I understand that. So got you're it? looking for an update regarding you the got asset it. inventory report. You got it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Number five, five point one, president's report. Well, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I thought something. Chairman O'Connell, right. thank you. It's ready. He's just uh, excited to give it to you. I know. Are you okay, Matt? <coughs> Oh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to take just a moment. I've got some prepared slides here, but um, just want to take a moment to thank Carmen Carter for being here today um, to highlight the partnership of JJC and uh, ABBA and, and Leda in term and also as well, but specifically ABBA. So thank her for being here. I want to thank uh, Supervisor Contreras. Um, Trustee Escutia for being here as well and really just thrilled at the support uh, from the township um, and thankful they put some pressure on others to, to do the same. Uh, you know, again, want to acknowledge Judy and her leadership. Um, when I think about, you know, the, the employees experience here at JJC and then we talk about the Black Teen Summit. Um, and just w really walking the halls and a lot of the things that Dr. Irvin does out of her office, you know, I'm reminded that when I say JJC honors all aspects of your identity, um, there's a lot behind that. Like it comes from somewhere, whether it's from a student centered perspective or our employees. So I just want to thank everyone who, um, who makes it possible for me to say that, right? That we do indeed honor all aspects of, of an individual's identity and, that relates to our proclamations uh, for different groups. We are indeed honoring all aspects of their identity. So thank you for that. Um, appreciate Trustee Broderick bringing up iGen and that will be uh, in my remarks tomorrow when the governor visits us, just an acknowledgement that we do serve as a fiscal agent, but that is meaningful as the governor has made a uh, green economy, sure. right? Part of his agenda and we are uh, involved in that certainly. And want to thank our partners with uh, the village of Shanahan, and I'm sensing uh, some consensus, and tell me if I'm wrong, uh, for a letter of support for, for the TIF, and let me know if I'm wrong. If not, then, uh, then we'll keep talking about it, but happy to support, I think, um, some of their efforts. Mm -hmm. All right, so here we go. The Black Teen Summit was a really fantastic event, uh, and if you and it's gotten a lot of traction on social media, and it's not because just because of our uh, promotion of the event through marketing and communications, uh, but it's because Congresswoman Underwood tweeted and posted about it. It's because Congressman Jackson tweeted and posted about it. It was a really fantastic event, another celebration of identity here at JJC. I wanna give just a, a kudos to DeAndre Butler who gave the opening and kind of ran the entire event. And then Tanetta Jones as well gave a closing at the end. So really powerful speakers, powerful statements. And as you do those social media searches, um, I, I hope you'll find the interview that Congresswoman Underwood did with Linda Miller and Aisha Ellis two emerging leaders in student government, uh, voices that I suspect we'll hear a lot more from over the next couple of years. So I just wanna give a huge shout out to both Linda and Aisha. Well, I'm not wearing the socks today, but again, just a quick shout out. I know, I know that was a big fail, but that's okay. Um, I've got multiple pairs and I've invested in these socks. So for those again, who've supported this campaign, um, I don't want to step too much on Amanda's report. Perhaps she'll share some numbers, details. Okay. Well, you know, and you've heard it, I think, before, uh, but we ordered 500. We sold 400. So socks, there are some socks left. Last year, I think the number was 250, and we sold out. Uh, this year, we sold 400 so far. So um, shout out to Storm, who I'm not sure how many takes that took right there but shout out to Storm for supporting our sock 
campaign as well. And I almost got Chief to smile, Commander. That's, that's Chief's biggest smile right there. Um, you know, here at JJC, we spend a lot of time uh, investing in our employees. And part of that is we shut down the college one day. We call it Educon. It's a whole day's worth of activities, um, a whole faculty and staff development day. So I just want to offer some numbers um, to, to kind of share with the trustees on what we're doing to support employees to be their best selves and to provide them with the resources they need to be successful. So over 400 attended, we offered 50 different sessions ranging from the mindset of change, making JJC an even better place to work, face-to-face -face versus online courses, getting things done, stress management and self-care, tackling food insecurity for JJC students, charting a compliance course, um, hit me with your best shot in EpiPen, uh, session, being college ready versus student ready, supplier diversity challenge, strategic scheduling, you, are you a legendary teacher, and on and on and on and on. So it was a huge day of professional development and I would consider it a, a big success. And thank you to everyone who made that day possible. In this room, we had all of the superintendents and not often do our academic leaders get to connect with all of our area superintendents. And I believe we had perfect attendance from all of our superintendents uh, there. And not pictured was Dr. Farmer. I think Dr. Farmer left just for a split second and I said, let's take a selfie and I apologize, <laughs> Dr. Farmer, for that. Uh, but again, we're doing a lot to work with our partner districts. And it goes well beyond, by the way, uh, 12 by 12 by 12. The, each one of our deans gave a presentation about their area and what they could do to work closer with all of our um, 26, I believe, feeder high school districts. So a great day. I want to thank uh, Trustee Morales, Trustee Broderick, uh, Trustee Budzinski there, and the rest of the staff for uh, joining me at the Grundy Economic Development Council annual dinner. More I continue to learn about Grundy County, Morris and the surrounding areas. I feel like we can do more uh, for that community in that space. Over on the left-hand side, you'll notice we were honored with a partnership award, recognizing us for 30 years being committed to the Grundy County Economic Development Council. So as we pursue opportunity and growth, in different areas. Yes, the K through 12 area. Yes, perhaps some out west. Uh, but I want to take some take a moment to highlight uh, a, what I would consider a success. And I'm just going to break down some numbers for you. But these are representatives from iCampus, essentially what we uh, what we call our virtual or online campus here at JJC. So pictured, you've got Chris Ostwinkle, you've got Denise Clark, you've got Todd Meskowitz, and not pictured, however, are Denise Caparula and Jeff Knuckles. And I love to take the opportunity to highlight specific areas. And this one over on the next slide, you'll see why. So I want you to just ignore the pandemic, right? These numbers are the pandemic as we, along with many of our sister institutions, all of them were sort of forced drastically into an online space, I want you to pay attention to spring 2019 and spring 2020. We'll start there, okay? And the orange bar, if you would, so not the full-time enrollment bar, but the headcount bar. So in spring 2020, right, we had 3,600 five headcount in our online campus, our iCampus. So fast forward to where we're starting to settle in to a more reasonable number and a ratio, I think, that is gonna find some success as long as we resource it, um, both short and long-term. So 4,600 approximately <coughs> headcount. Now from a percentage standpoint, from a percentage standpoint, let's compare pre-pandemic was relatively low compared to our peer institutions in the state and I would offer nationally as a point of reference Previous college uh, I worked at, it was about 30%, and I thought that was low. In fact, among all 10 Maricopa colleges, it was the lowest at 30%. So pre-pandemic, we were about 24, 25%. 
Post-pandemic, currently we're at about 43% of our offerings. Now, that might be something to celebrate. The previous number might be something to celebrate as we're seeing more students taking online classes. My focus and my challenge to our academic leaders will always be on student success. Over the years, you'll notice that there is a student success gap across modalities. Students typically are more successful in person, oftentimes might be more successful in a hybrid environment, but typically the online student success numbers when compared to those previous two modalities are lower. So we're laser focused on that gap and closing that gap. So as we start to talk about opportunities for growth, it will not just be for growth's sake. It will not be just to grow the online campus or grow iCampus, but it will also be focused on the success that our students experience or achieve rather in the online space as well. So that takes obviously resources, individuals, technology to support all of the activities in iCampus. So again, just a big shout out to uh, Chris Oswinkle and the iCampus group. Oh, I skipped through one, didn't I? So tomorrow, um, Governor Pritzker will be here and it's gonna be a fantastic opportunity, I think, to showcase JJC and what we do. So the governor's taking a tour of Illinois Community Colleges, although he's got just four stops. He's got Lakeland Community College, he's got Malcolm X and Heartland Community College. Did I say one of them wrong, KRT? Uh -uh. Lincoln Land, gosh, there's so many lands. Lincoln Land, Lincoln? College of Lake Dude, County, I know. I know, <laughs> Lincoln Land Community College. Um, uh -huh. So we're, I believe, third on the stop. So I wanted to take a moment, I know I mentioned this last meeting, uh, but some of the things I'll be highlighting in my opening as I'll be welcoming the governor to the podium, historic investments in community colleges. And I recognize that it's strange for me to say historic having only been here for nine months. However, they are historic investments. A 7% increase yeah. to community yeah. colleges, um, that's, that hasn't happened in 20 years, mm -hmm. right? And so when you talk about a $100 million increase in the monetary award program mm -hmm. at JJC, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this out because I think it's, it's of significance. It'll give you a, an, an insight into the number of students that actually receive, you know, like what is this impact on us? So you think $100 million, 2,565 students at JJC receive the MAP award, 2,565. Now that's after federal financial aid. We distribute $3,829,000, $105 in MAP awards. So that number is both for community colleges and universities. It's gonna have a huge impact. The number goes from 600 million up to 700 million. So it's something I plan to celebrate in my remarks uh, before introducing the governor. $10 million for non-credit programs, advanced manufacturing electric vehicles, 5.2 million for workforce training grants. And I can't, you know, I can't help it, but I will highlight 12 by 12 by 12 because the governor's budget also includes $3.2 million to support dual credit at community colleges. So it's gonna be a fantastic event. It's being tightly controlled as you, imag as you imagine it would be with the governor and the Lieutenant Governor here, mind you, for those of you who will be there along with us, um, I'm thankful for that and you'll be helping us celebrate the Governor's <coughs> um, budget proposal. So with that, Chairman, I'll yield the rest of my time and thanks for giving me the opportunity to highlight the good work You're welcome. That our staff is doing. You're welcome. And five <coughs> representative to the JJC Foundation. Hey, Amanda. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me tonight. The foundation board actually met this morning at 730. So Klein and I have had a very long day yeah. <laughs> and I have a few updates for you from the board. Uh, first, uh, this year, the foundation is celebrating its 50th anniversary. So I want you to all mark your calendars for Friday, September 15th for our 50th anniversary event. The event will take place at the Rialto Square Theater and will begin at 5 p.m. We will be giving, giving out our awards that we typically give out at Night of Stars that evening. And we'll also be highlighting some uh, programs on our campus like Fine Arts. So um, it's going to be a great night. 
Uh, be on the look, look out for a save the date and an invitation in the coming months. Speaking of 50th anniversary, the Spring Appeal, which usually goes out in April, thinking it's going to go out around mid-April this year, is going to actually highlight a new scholarship endowment commemorating the 50th anniversary. So we have already ex uh, secured about $18,000 for that endowment. Um, as you may know, the endowment level is 30000 so I think we're going to get there um, since we haven't even sent out our solicitation yet. In the spring, we also hold our employee giving campaign. This year's theme is thanks for being our students' number one fan. Fan And our pep rally week starts next week, so all of our employees will be visiting our office. Last year, employees donated over $100,000 to the foundation. A large portion of that money goes to student emergency, as well as scholarships. Uh, I know you often like to get an update on scholarships. Our fall application is currently open for uh, scholarships. We've had nine, 973 students have started the application. 430 have completed it. We continue to find multiple ways to market our scholarship to um, incoming students as well as current students. Uh, one of the things our foundation board has been doing is going out to the high school admissions or um, their where students can come in and talk to admissions. They also are going there. Our board members are sitting there and providing information on scholarships. Um, our flyers, one side is Spanish, one side is English, so they can bring it home to their families if their parents are uh, Spanish speaking. Um, lastly, I got one more thing to um, update you on. We always provide you on um, our year-end giving, which our numbers for year-end typically, typically start coming in in November. And we really are still getting gifts in February. So uh, we're proud to say that the total raised for year end from just our appeal and then our endowment report. So not any other gifts like the party we had where we raised money for client scholarship and things like that. Uh, we raised over $600,000. So that's my up update for the day. Does anyone have any questions for me? Oh, I oh, just want to compliment you that we should give compliments to the mayor of Morris and the mayor of Shanahan yes. for buying into the socks and putting it all over social media. Missy and Chris definitely did their job of showing support for JJC. Yes, and I think they are actually competitive over it now. So. Very much so. Very <laughs> Chris much mentioned so. it today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, Amanda. Mm -hmm. 5.3, representative to ICCTA and ACCT with alacrity. Sounds good. All right. This past weekend, September 10th and 11th, we had our ICCTA meeting up in Lombard, which was really a great meeting. Um, the roundtable, and you're going to be surprised when I tell you what the roundtable discussion was, because we had 11 questions, but only one of them had a chance to even get answered. And here's the question, dual credit, dual enrollment, universities oppose our effort to expand our offerings to include bachelor's degrees, but then go and offer dual enrollment and dual credit at a significant lower fee. A, would you support legislation to define dual enrollment and dual credit offerings as a first right of refusal going to Illinois community colleges? B, what are community colleges doing with regards to dual credit versus dual enrollment? Do you offer both at your college? Are colleges offering discounts for these programs? What do your enrollment numbers look like? Heated discussion that went round the table for two and a half hours. The end result was that they agreed there was so much confusion between dual credit, dual enrollment, that they think that we should have a panel discussion on it. Well, lo and behold, we've mentioned dual credit in the 12 by 12 by 12, which I did mention at our conference. And we are going to have the pleasure, because he has agreed to it. Wait, wait, uh, wait, wait. You did. You did. Sorry, you're already, you're already escalated to the pre presenter. Um, <laughs> in September at our meeting, uh, we normally hold the roundtable, and then we have a conference in the afternoon for, you know, presentation. And because this became such a heated topic of the 12 by 12 by 12, which we're anticipating probably will be Illinois' choice of going. So because of that, our group is loving the, in, the engagement of Dr. Namuo to be our presenter. And, you know, 
We've also got the ICCB that will be there that wants to be there for the rules and regulations. They also know that Dr. Namuo is part of the HLC, which gives us the credits for, you know, what we can do for dual enrollment. But everybody is looking to see what JJC is doing, because now that they've heard the 12 by 12 by 12, and they like the 12 by 12 by 12, this is like a heated issue. So this is great. So just so you guys know, September, mark your calendars, because I'll have the dates for you and where we're going to be meeting for that. And then the next thing that we discussed, and I'm going to bring this to all your attention, February 24th was the cutoff for Distinguished Alumni Award, Equity and Diversity Award, Gary Davis Ethical Leadership Award, Gigi Campbell Student Trustee Excellence Award, Paysetter Award, Professional Board Staff Member Award, and Ray Harstein Trustee Achievement Award. Unfortunately, we didn't submit anybody, and we should have. The next deadline is March 31st for the Business Industry Partnership Award, the Gandhi King Peace Scholarship, the Greg Chadwick Student Service Scholarship, Lifelong Learning Award, Outstanding Adjunct Faculty Member Award, Outstanding Full-Time Faculty Member Award, Pace Setter Award, and the Paul Simon Student Essay Contest. These need to be in by March 31st. Kelly, how do we get that around so everybody can know what the criteria are so that we have JJC present because I sit on this award committee and I feel like I'm going to give you all of the ones that won because I think Josh would have been a great one for our student trustee. After I read all the student trustees, Josh, you would have come in first. Totally. You've done a great job here. Is there anything we can do so that we have more people submitted? We actually are working on those for March and the ones that you um, referenced already that were due in February were ones that we... A lot of them won just last year. So we pulled back from those and we're focusing on the ones for uh, March. Okay, because I sit on that committee and I need to have an idea that we are submitting because I felt like we didn't have anybody. Everybody goes, don't you have anybody from JJC? I'm like, calm down. There I'm going to mention it. There will it. be multiple submissions for the ones in March. And if you'd like a full list, I can provide that. Is there anything that the trustees should be submitting at all? Is there any opportunity for trustees to submit? Because there are four scholarships, too, for student scholarships that I think Josh should be aware of so that he can disseminate that information to his student entity group. When that follows him. When CCTA releases this information, I work directly with the student development team, okay. uh, not just one person, but across the board, and we determine how to select those. Okay, so do you have enough tools. information on all of us then? Absolutely. Yep. Okay, then as long as we have that, that's good. Yep. All right. And I do have, I'll give you the list of all those that had won or that were, were, were criteria, and then I'll give you the whole package of what they submitted for all of these for the, the awards for the March 20, or February 23rd one. So you guys can at least get an idea of what we can and can't submit that was considered for consideration. And then um, in June is our banquet that we're going to have, our final one for all the awards that we'll, they'll be winning in June. And then in June, I do become the president of the ICCTA. So that's going to be a big thing that JJC is recognized for with if we have awards and that. So that and then in August, because we have the retreat for the president who usually sits on the ICCTA, we have it scheduled for August 18th and 19th, and our trustees are allowed to come to that if they want to see what's going on. But more details will follow because I'm working with the ICCTA and Klein to get everything arranged for that and what we're going to be doing on campus and campus tours too. And that concludes the ICCTA report. I'll give my other one in the ACCT and the NLS conference one. Five point four NLS conference reports. Are you ready? <clears throat> the NLS summit was held on February fifth to the eighth. Okay. Attending was Dr. Namuo, Kelly Roder Tonelli, our trustee Josh, and myself. The legislators set to visit were Congressman Darren LaHood, Congressman Robin Kelly, Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, and Congressman Ronald Jackson. There's a funny little thing that I should tell you on this part. Most of the times we get to see their administrative assistant or their connection that talks to us. Um, Kelly chased down Darren LaHood to the elevator to make sure, because we all noticed that it was him walking by, and sh she ran directly for him, and we all cornered him at the elevator and got to say hello since he's our new representative for this area. So it was a very interesting 
conference that we had by the elevator. But we also had group visits of the ICT of all the ICT CCTA members to meet Senator Durbin and Duckworth. Topics openly discussed were all one about reformation of student aid for today's students. It dealt with establishing Pell Grants, eligibility for short-term programs. Currently, workforce-oriented programs are excluded, and this would benefit both the students and our businesses. Invest in basic needs, support for students. Title IV assistance is rarely generous enough to cover all the necessities, food, housing, transportation, child care, and needed exp and medical expenses. Three, the focus student tax policy on those who can benefit the most. End of the taxation on Pell Grants. Make them tax-free, because right now they're taxable. Support altering the 2500 American Opportunity Tax Credit, so Pell Grants awards aren't subtracted from students' eligible expenses. Um, bolster the role of community colleges in workforce development. Strengthen them, strengthen them, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which is the WIOA, which prioritize credential attainment and streamline reporting requirements. Greater training opportunities should be available and provided for that. Fund key education and workforce programs. Boost the Pell Grant maximum award. Bolster job training and career and technical education. And then to continue supporting the DREAMers, give them permanent legal status of residence here. Uh, the community colleges should be guaranteed part partnership of the leadership up. Oh, God, I'm reading my writing. It's gone all crazy. Community college should be guaranteed part of the leadership needed for the workforce development policy at both state and local level. So we should be involved both state and locally. And what I'm going to share with you is what we provided to Duckworth and Durbin, Senators Duckworth and Durbin, um, what the ICT legislative priorities are. Community college baccalaureate degrees, preparing Illinois future workforce, protection of the MAP grant recipients, local control of community colleges, equitable funding for community college operations, equity in higher education, in education, including neurodiversity. And what was nice was we provided each one of our uh, Congress people, Congresswomen and men, the information about JJC. As Dr. Namuo was stating, we provided the federal grant grant sum summary on us, as well as other federal programs that we have from 2021 to 2022. And of that, we have recipients of 2,686, the amount of money awarded, 451,407. It's amazing, these numbers, and they all were looking at what we had. And it's good that Kelly provided all this information to be given to them because it gave them a key eye of what their first community college is doing and what the best community college is doing, which is JJC. And then um, while they were meeting with all of the others, because there were some of us that split off, I met with the Department of Education, um, and they went through discussing with us, the head of the Department of Education, what we were concerned about with the baccalaureate in the four-year baccalaureate. And they are working hard to get that where we as community colleges, because they know that there's a deficiency in the people in the nursing and in the need for the medical for that. And being that my generation, <clears throat> I'm saying my generation, the age group, uh, we're going to all need that medical attention. So they're knowing that we're going to probably be about 20 million shy of nurses, which is a huge number. So Noah Brown, who's the Department Head of Education, who also used to be on the ACCT, has gone to the colleges that are separately working intently on it, and they also know that Dr. Namuo was responsible for that in Arizona. So that came out as a key factor that he wants to know what JJC is thinking and what we're doing and moving in that direction. And aren't you involved in the baccalaureate, too, with the ICCTA? So we are working you know, together to make sure that we can see if we can get the Bachelor of Nursing. We won't subtract anything from any of the colleges that are around us, the four-year universities, is working with the ones that come with us for the two years and keep them so they get their, their bachelors, their BSN with us. And that concludes my report. Josh? It'll leave a whole lot for me to say. You basically <laughs> said everything. <laughs> Josh, I know you have five, the student... Five point five is student the student, per the student <laughs> perspective. Sorry about that, Josh. I was... You know, I got to tell you, I have a couple things. No? I'm just apologizing to him. Oh, you did a good job. That was a you very a good, good job. report. You were very, you covered all of the bases there. Um, I, I don't know what else to say on top of that, but I got a couple things. 
Yeah, but give your student perspective because it was your first time there. And I think that's a warm, inviting, you know, ability to do because our last one didn't get to go because of COVID. Explain and share because you even got an opportunity for internship. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't want to go into detail about that. I'm going to keep that a little on the confidential okay. side. But um, so much for secrets. Right? <laughs> I know that was just blown. So I'm going to start out with some of the sessions that we went to. So we went to an opening session, which was, I think, the day we, was it the day we flew in the day afterwards? It's been a while. Um, we went to an opening session where there was a, um, a speech given by Secretary of Transportation B. Buttigieg. Um, that was very cool to see. And he discussed about how um, the different, the movement in the area of transportation and how that um, collides with community college interests. Um, there was a work, there was a, um, um, discussion on accreditation, and there was very good discussion on the role of community colleges across the United States. There was a panel that spoke, um, and they were talking about like how um, stuff in Europe works in terms of they don't entirely have community college is as like a system there, but they do have different colleges that are tooled out more towards the workforce. And the process by which one goes from high school into college and into the workforce is a little bit different. Um, and it was really cool to hear that kind of detail because it's just different to the way that we do it here in the States. Um, there was a morning session um, where there was a discussion on the economic outlook. Um, it was a very long discussion. Um, Trustee Broderick, I'm sure you were, um, both me and you were paying attention to that one. And there was a lot of talk about how bonds, of how the federal funds rate, the changing of the federal funds rate is going to be affecting bonds and how that's relevant to community colleges. Also, cost of living index and inflation and the different um, uh, numbers for employment. So UE5, UE6. Um, we met with the aides of, re of the representatives, and that was a very interesting experience because I'd never been in a space like that before because um, how do you even go about doing that? Um, so I spent a lot of time reading up to make sure I could, I could speak on the issues um, as eloquently as I can, have all the data, but I actually found that doing all that reading was important, yeah, but the real important part was having the personal experience um, behind it. Um, I found myself talking more about like mental health and what that means to students on campus. Um, I found that to be much more impactful and not important, but as important sometimes as even things like Pell Grants. Um, so I'm very glad I had the opportunity to talk to the representatives. Um, the senators. So I we flew in near the end of the discussion with um, Dick Durbin and uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth. But I got to ask a question related to that, again, mental health, um, how that is being seen at the federal level. And the result that I got from that was kind of a, it's very important, but with the makeup of Congress, it might be difficult to get movement in that area, which is understandable. But I thought it was still a very interesting overall experience. And then lastly was the student meeting. So there was a meeting for the student trustees, so for the ACCT um, Student Advisory Committee. And what ended up happening in that meeting was that we revoked, um, revoked the bylaws and reset them back to the original ACCT standards. What that means is that we kind of had a abstract mess of bylaws and we cleaned it all up. So that's essentially what ended up occurring. And we also confirmed all of our officers. And then we had like a light workshop to talk about um, comparing and contrasting community colleges from across the nation and also how we as individuals vocalize those differences as well as how we talk to those around us about those differences. So it was a very interesting conference. I'm very happy to have gone and yeah, that was Washington, D.C. So thank you very much. Thanks, Josh. It was great to have you. And the thing you have to know is we only get about 20 minutes to 30 to speak to these oh, yeah. individual Congress people. And what I went through, we have so much to discuss with them that we want to make sure that they know that what our concerns are. And we each have an opportunity to speak. We let Dr. Nemo go first as the president to share his position. You know, the trustee gets his position, Kelly got her position, and so as I as a trustee got ours. And it's really good to see how they relate to all of us as we're talking to them and how they listen and receive very well and understand where we're at. And it seems like the majority of them, I guess the, sh the short-term Pell has been the big issue, and that seems to be the focus of concern, if, you, if we agree on that. And it's to get more shorter, it's to get shorter amount of hours so we get certifications so that we do go in today's trend 
trends of training people to get them back into the workforce. Speaking of shortening hours, let's go. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Buildings and grounds report. 5.6. Oh, I got the student trustee report. Here's I mean, if you want to go first. Student trustee. Uh, All right. Well, go up there real quick. Karen, I got the clicker. All right. This is the student trustee report for March the 15th of 2023. So theory of relativity was a play that was um, that was held here on March the 2nd, 3rd, 4th and 5th. And it talks and the theory of relativity, you would think it would be physics based. Um, I thought it was physics based. That's the first place I went with it. But it's really about how um, how people interact with each other. Theory of relativity, we're all relative to each other in our place in the world. So it was a very cool play. Um, the NSLS and JJC uh, met, uh, when was this? March the 2nd, 3rd, and 6th, and over 100 students attended and participated in the NSLS Leadership Training Day. The, it was actually really, really cool. It was like the ACCT event, but on a more local level. So instead of there being major differences, like where the trustee from Texas that I was talking to or the trustee from California would have like major differences in the way that their institutions operated. This was a little bit more close to home. So it was a little bit easier to compare and contrast and be like, here's something that works at our institution or at um, student government where we're at. This is something that works where they're at. And then we can compare and contrast and see what needs to be done maybe at our own institutions. So talking to the student leaders there was very enlightening. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody that for attending that. So the Collegiate Club Council meeting was on Wednesday, March the 1st, and there was a lot of discussion on a new uh, subcommittee um, for DEI. So that's, that's looking to probably be passed next at the next CCC meeting. So the Blazer has a, as, as they do, has another monthly edition and it should be right in front of all the trustees and for the, everybody in the audience there are um stands on which you can grab um art of the blazer so um, i'd recommend giving that a read there's also the word eater so the word eater is a literary magazine so for stuff like poetry or like short stories essays song lyrics artwork hand-drawn digital and photography and this is for students and faculty and staff. So if anybody would like to submit poetry or song lyrics or artwork, um, upload your file to word either at jjc.edu so it can be included. Facade. So I remember talking about this, if the board recalls, back in October, where there is a short film currently in production and it has recently concluded. They're putting the finishing touches on it and it is going to be on March the 23rd of 2023 in J Building. There's going to be a red carpet event with all the actors and actresses. Food will be served for the guests and at 12.30 the movie will begin. It's a, I believe it's a 45 minute long movie and then there will be a mental health panel at the very end to discuss the implications of mental health on campus and society at large. I invite everybody in this room to please attend this event. It is very, very important, and it would be an amazing opportunity for the trustees to engage with students on this important topic and for staff to engage with students on a topic students have a very difficult time. So I extend this invitation to everyone. Thank you. Thanks. I have it. I should have. I think I edited this a while ago because saying new student trustee email and not putting the email underneath is a little <laughs> bit of an error. Um, so I'll get that out to everybody. But I am on the back end. I've been doing a ton of work over the last like month and a half. And one of the things that you guys will see at the moment um, is a new student trustee email. I have my JJC email, which also gets student trustee information. And when those things are mixed together, it is impossible to disentangle them. It is a it can be kind of a mess. So the new student trustee email is all lowercase student trustee dot jjc uh, at jjc dot edu um, it's i'll send it out to everybody and if you have any inquiries for the student trustee now and in the future please send it to this email address instead of my personal one it's just to keep things nice and separated and for um 
like policy related issues. So that way at the end of my term, I can make sure that all the stuff in there is separated out. So, so the Herbert Trackman Planetarium is now doing new shows. Um, they are open after the pandemic and I recently had the opportunity to go to one, um, which was very exciting for me for a variety of reasons. But uh, I got a little bit of time, I can tell a short story. So I'm a physics major uh, and I intend to go into cosmology. The reason I am a physics major is because years ago, when I was a wee lad, when I was like this big, I, as a part of Cub Scouts, went to the Herbert Trackman Planetarium here at JJC. I was probably like maybe six or seven years old at the time, and it left a huge impact on me. The reason that I'm pursuing my degree in cosmology is because I went to the Trackman Planetarium here at JJC. That's the reason I'm doing what I'm doing. It put me on the path for the rest of my life of something not only that I'm interested in, but I want to make a career of. So I'm very, very pleased to see the planetarium back up and running. They have a ton of new upgrades. They got new shows and they're currently applying for a big grant. So I'm really excited to see where this goes. And my last report as student trustee will be at next month's board meeting. I just want to make sure everybody was aware of that. And the new student trustee process is underway, healthy and exciting. Um, I've been talking with um, the candidates and one of my major pushes in the next couple weeks is, and in weeks prior, is to make sure that all the student trustee candidates are aware of the position, what goes into it, and how to operate in the position. And I have a big project on the back end that I've been working on to help <coughs> facilitate this. So, and that concludes my report. Josh, thank you. Hey, Josh, can you send me any the, questions? Can you, send, can you send me the date of that um, of that movie screen? Just you text me because you got my yeah yeah sure. Watching. I can send you the date. And just side note, I took my three year old to the Trackman Planetarium mm -hmm. to see the story of Kaleo. To get a three year old to sit through forty five minutes of that is pretty amazing, and he sat through it and enjoy, actually it's like a half hour. He actually enjoyed it. So if you haven't had a chance to go, go check it out because it's a pretty special place we have here on campus. Awesome. So. Yeah. Any other questions? Josh, you mentioned how the um, planetarium was very impactful for you. So I actually gave my granddaughter like a tour of the campus, maybe I think it was like right after COVID. And she it was close. It was on the weekend. But I noticed that she was like really curious about it. So I'm hope that I'm hoping that she's just is impacted just as much as you were. So thank you for sharing that. I will continue to encourage her to go. Thank you, Trustee Morales. Any other questions? Oh, the report. Oh, oh. oh Juliana. Just because it. Oh, sorry. If you want, I can. Oh, wait, you want. Okay, so speaking about the planetarium, um, I just had a just a very small question: Is the planetarium sensory friendly? By any chance, you know, it, 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 like um, for like autism, um, things that you know. My, my son's kind of—he's got a little hearing issue, and mm. it, it wasn't too loud for him. So um, I don't know. His is—he got tubes put in recently, so I'm not sure if that helps out a little bit. But he—I don't—it's—it's it's not too bad. Um, he enjoyed it. He sat through it. Wasn't scared by the sounds at all. So thank you. Mm -hmm. a little bit more, I'm not going to say, a little less, less like flashing lights. So, mm -hmm. um, that's the only thing that I would be super concerned about is it's kind of like a movie. Um, but if there's like a technical error, like sometimes you can get some flashing lights or other disruptive visual issues. So that would be the only concern I could be about. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good thank you. question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Nothing else. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. I didn't mean to cut you off there, but uh, kind of did. But you know, five point six building and grounds committee report. I'll keep mine relatively short then, because we only had really one one item to approve. Uh, which we approved was is the finishing of the ring road restoration and resurfacing project, and plus is also going to be doing the South Auto Shop uh, parking lot as well. Um, this one was went out to bid, came under a budget. Um, I think it was projected at 325,000, came in at 235,000. Um, it was won by Deconstruction in Coal City. 
and it looks like the project's actually going to start uh, start uh, start uh, going into process in mid-May. Um, some great news also, the AHU replacement project, which we were talking about before with the CDB, and they're going to fund basically $4.5 million of the project out of the five uh, the six million dollar project that it is uh, is actually going out to bid and it looks like it's the bid is opening up March 23rd I want to warn you on that uh, equipment is out a long time but for these rooftop units you're probably looking about a year lead time before this actually goes in the process a um, couple other projects upcoming is the facade repairs uh, which will be looks like it'll probably be um, it's out in process right now in March bidding, so it's going to probably be out in April or May in front of us as well. A CNA Lab and at Romeoville is also getting some updates, and it looks like that's going to be out for bid in March and be out in April or May to us as well. Um, in construction right now is a replacement of the G uh, building switch gear, uh, replacing the B building. Um, a G building and deal building, I guess. Uh, the D building main power transformation. I'm sorry about that. And um, this is already approved. And then also the remodel of the G building restrooms is also in process as well. Um, in design, the, the oh, wow. new boardroom. Yeah, you know it. it, it's, it's in in process of being in design right now. So this is a major project that Dr. Namu would like to make this a better place for us. So. Other than that, that's all I have. Josh, Josh always takes my thunder. I need to go before Josh. Josh needs to go after him. <laughs> I did give you the opportunity. That yeah. was, that was <laughs> so, Okay. Sounds Thanks, good. Jesse. Thanks. Oh, all right. 5.7. Board Policy Committee Report. We already had an overview earlier. Good. I would just like to add that... Um, we are not meeting next month due to the election, and we may have a new policy committee after that. So you never know. <laughs> it may not be me. It may not be Alicia. We don't know. Right. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens. I think you guys do a wonderful job. Well, thank you. Yeah. 5.8 Finance Committee Report. Finance Committee has not met since the last time we were together here as a board. Okay, that's easy. So, um, is that what you two say too, Jake? That's I, I second that one. Okay, second <laughs> that. Okay, all right. Uh, Five point nine is uh, is me, and uh, we're gonna keep it rolling and uh, make it uh, uh, make it smooth like this. Uh, you know, besides remembering to, you know. Watch for the Russians and uh, and everything like that. Um, uh, I, I just want to I just want to leave you with this. Uh, if you remember uh, Gary Larson, uh, he uh, did uh, comic strips and uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> there was one comic uh, that he did where uh, uh, there was a uh, you know there was a, a guy with with uh, long white hair and uh, and he was writing writing the comic and uh, and. Uh, and Gary Larson's captioning was um, like this because <clears throat> the comic said uh, um, showed the guy with the white hair and he was he was where he was writing on the board and uh, <clears throat> and it said uh, E equals M C squared equals a dollar sign and uh, and the caption was the that uh, Einstein realizes that time is money. And uh, that's all I have tonight. And uh, right. <laughs> tonight. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Jake. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Meeting is adjourned.